again with very nice drawing, notations, equations, and then some results, and then main results, and then references, and this was your presentation. Okay, so again, just for you to have an idea, and then we'll come back to this later on. And now I'm going to put the second one. So this was presented at the conference. I don't, I don't know, is the author here, no? I'm one of the authors. Okay, Yuli is one of the authors. So, this was presented in a conference uh, that was held last year uh, here in, in, in Moscow. It's a, a well-known conference. So, again, the outline with some topics, then network deployment, some views about what the network deployment is, with some information and a figure, then again coming to the outline, some assumptions with the figure, then explaining this uh, figure with uh, a title, then of course the presentation continues, I'm not going to get coming back to the outline, then again another figure. Uh, this, this, the room, okay, is a little bit small, so you probably can uh, read all of these. Can you read these in the back? <laughs> no. No, I think. Okay, but we'll come back to this. Then, uh, this full of equations, then some, okay, let's go this fast, of course, just to show you this, then numeric analysis, uh, then some, so the idea here is to compare two situations, the unicast and the multicast, uh, then, of course, the, and then the conclusions, and then thank you. Okay, these were two presentations, now, I'm going to, once, Sorry. Okay, sorry, let me. Okay, so again, this is the engineer speaking, so my apologies for this. But of course, I don't need to motivate you that we need to do presentations. Of course, we are in academia. We don't have clients, we don't have managers, at least you are not supposed to, or at least not directly, but definitely we have colleagues and we have teams and we need to present this to many people. So this means that it's really important and again, I'm saying this is in engineering, but this is valid for many areas that we uh, need to, um, to do presentations. And then comes one very important thing right now which is many of the presentations that we do, we do these presentations of something that has already been written. These two presentations that I've shown here, so one was Igor's, you had published already the, the report, right? And you are giving these to someone, to the committee that had read the report, right? So, the presentation was being given to a team of professors or something like this that had the report already. So you don't need to put a lot of information that is the report, you just need to show the key aspects of the work. And the same goes when you are presenting a paper the, in a conference, like the second presentation. People will have access to the written paper. So this means that you don't need to present all the things that are in the paper. You just need to extract the more important aspects that are in the paper. Because the people that are really interested in your work, they will go and read the paper. So this means that, on, the, on some sense, we need to follow the, the structure of the paper, or the written report, and do something that uh, has to do with this uh, perspective. Now, there are three things that we need to, to do here. So basically, there are many of us, not all of us, many of us are professors in the room. And as professors, we have a very, we have one problem when we talk in public, some of us, which is we are used to give lectures. And when we give lectures, we are talking to students. 
And when we are talking to students, basically, we are putting on the students the effort to understand us. It's very unfair, but many times that's how it works. So we know we are giving a, a class on telecommunications. I know everything about telecommunications. So, and I'm sharing my knowledge with the students. So the students need to study. They need to go home. They need to study. And of course, after they study, hopefully they will fulfill in the exam and they will pass. But the problem here is that I don't need to sell sell anything when I'm lecturing. Because I, in, 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 in English there is one thing which is I have the upper hand, which means I'm, I have the power, right? I'm the professor. Now, if you want to present, if you are a student and you want to present your thesis work, if you are in a conference and you want to present your work to colleagues, if you are competing for a project proposal, a research proposal, and you want to present your research proposal to, pro to colleagues or to the committee, the situation has changed completely. You are no longer in power. You don't have the upper hand. The upper hand is in the hands of the committee that is going to decide on your paper, on your thesis, on your proposal. It's a completely different viewpoint. And this means that from this viewpoint, I need to convince someone, being the members of the committee or the audience of a, in a conference, whatever, that my work is very good. And I need to make them understand and be interested in my work. So you understand this is a completely different perspective from teaching. And again, we as professors sometimes tend to forget this, but we shouldn't. And this means that when we are, again, not teaching, but doing the other stuff, there are some things that we need to take into consideration. One is that we need to establish a connection with the audience. And establishing a connection means that the effort to be understood is, cannot be from the audience. It has to be from my side as a presenter. It's what I'm doing here today. I'm sharing information with you. So what I'm doing today here is, let's say, a mixture of the two things I've told you before, of course. But this is very important. I need to establish a connection with the audience. I need to gain the audience, being a committee, being a conference, that they are interested in my work and they believe my work is very good. Then, I need that the information passed on to them is very smoothly and, again, they don't need to make too much effort to understand what I'm telling them. And this is very important, again, because if you need to make an effort to understand something, especially these days, what you start doing immediately is to pick up your phone and you start, or your laptop or whatever, and you disconnect. And you start reading emails or you start seeing the news or whatever you want to do. Right? So that's, you know, the, the, you know there's a difference between making movies to, making films to movies and TV. Do you know this? The difference is very simple. In, when you make, when the guys, not myself, I've never done one. Yeah? But when they make a film, to a cinema, you buy the ticket, and you are going to be there for one and a half hours. So of course you can leave, right? But usually you're there, you already paid the ticket, you're there. So making a movie or a film to a cinema, you have an audience that will be there for one and a half hours or two hours, doesn't matter. Making a film to TV has to be done in a completely different way. Do you know why? Because of this. Because I'm sitting at home with my remote and control. I can turn off. Excuse me? Yeah, I can turn off you. Yes. And if I don't like the movie, I just push a button and I change one of the one. Right? It's very simple. So they cannot make cinema, they cannot make movies in the same way. Right? I mean, once you, you hear this, it's clear. Right? But, so that's a little bit what you have to do in presentations these days. 
we need to capture the, the audience attentions, we need to show them that we are very good, that it is unfair that we still have not won the Nobel Prize, I'm exaggerating of course, but that's a little bit the idea. So, and this reinforcement means we have to be in a good environment, we don't want to insult anyone and all these kind of things, and, but there's one thing here, which is there's a key message we want to convey and to pass to people. And this is what we want to do. So, making a good presentation is choosing information. That's one of the key aspects of making a good presentation. How long have you taken doing your work? Mm, presentation or? No, no, the work. Maybe it, uh, three months? No. Six months? Two semesters. Two semesters, one year. So, he has worked one year. And if you do a PhD thesis, you work four or five years, right? And then you have 20 minutes, half an hour, to make a presentation. So can, can you do the ratio, the number of hours? I mean, it's 10 to the minus 10 or whatever. I don't know exactly. At bachelor is. level, they have seven minutes. Seven minutes. So it's 10 to the minus 12. Not more. What is it? After <laughs> that, I interrupt them. See? Seven the minutes. the chair first. And did six months the, the, the thesis? Yes, yes, so it's six yes. months, see? So do the math. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but each week, assuming they work 40 hours, so, you know, I don't know how many weeks, and then seven minutes. It's, the ratio is 10 to the minus 10 or whatever. So, of course, you are not going to present everything. That's very obvious. And the same happens when we go to a conference. We are not going to present the whole paper because we don't have time for that. We have 15 minutes. And the paper is five, ten pages. So the problem that we have is to choose information. And like anything else in life, this is a curve that you can easily understand. I don't know what is the mathematical equation for it, but it doesn't matter either. But this is the curve. Meaning, the more resources we have to do something, the less difficult it is. If this university would have twice as many professors, oh, it would be much better, right, Constantine? Of course, each one of us would be teaching less and we have more time for research or for doing other things. If you have more space, then you'd be, the, the problem you're talking about, the, the, size, the, the length of the lecture. If you had more money, you had probably these in all rooms, but we don't have it. And the resource that we have to deal with when we are doing a presentation is time. We don't have enough time to explain everything. By definition, we don't have it. So we are, we are working somewhere in here, depending on whether you are presenting a paper, a thesis, or whatever. And you know there are, there are, there are people which their profession is to work here close to zero. Do you know who these people are? People working in advertising. They want to sell a car. Can you imagine a car? A car is a very complex piece of technology, right? It has a lot of things. Can you imagine someone selling a car and explaining all the things that the car does? It would take two hours and then still you would not understand because I don't care how the engine works and how the sensors are connected, right? For me, a car is a black box. But selling a car is by these days, cars are sold by energy efficiency, right? They used to be sold by speed, but no one wants to drive a car at 500 kilometers per hour because you cannot drive it. So the key aspect for the cars these days, I mean, they show the design, but then is the, is the energy efficiency of the car. How much it consumes per 100 kilometers and this kind of things. So they have chosen one point out of the many or the comfort or whatever it is. So, that's, that's the problem that we need to address here. So, establishing the connection. You need to create interest in the audience for the presentation. And this means that, contrary to what we are used when doing a presentation, uh, sorry, writing a paper, we need to call the attention at the very first minutes. The way we structure scientific papers, it's not, not saying it's wrong. What I'm saying is that the way you structure a presentation should capture the attention of people. So the abstract introduction, all these kind of things. And again, this effort needs to be done by the presenter. 
It's in our hands, it's on our shoulder to capture your attention as an audience and to make all the efforts that need to be done so that you keep listening at me until the end of this course today, or workshop, or whatever. It's my role to do that, not yours. If you start slipping, I'll just throw this. No, I'm just... Okay, so this means that we can take, we should take some, let's say, scientific approach to these, because this is not just talking, right? And so the thing is, we need to understand the audience. Because, again, doing a presentation in a conference should be different of doing a presentation to a committee that is going to evaluate the thesis. And should be different from a presentation to a committee that is going to evaluate the project proposal, research project proposal. There are different audiences, they want different things, and we should prepare different presentations. So we need to understand who are they, who are these people? What do they want? What, sorry, what do we want them to do? Because, again, if it's a research proposal, we want them to give us the highest mark, right? But if you are presenting a paper, we want them to be interested in our work. Because if they are interested in our work, then probably later on they will be quoting our work, they will establish in collaboration with us, different things. What do we want them to understand? Again, it's a different thing. What are their interests? What are their needs, if it is the case? So we need to understand these, and we need to think about the questions and what we need to do for these questions. So what do we want to communicate? What, what is really the key message? So my key message today is very simple. I'm sharing with you on how you should do presentations and how you should present project proposal. That's, that is my key message. If he's defending his thesis, his key message is, I've done the best work, I've developed an excellent model, the model is beyond being excellent and you need to give me the highest mark. If you are presenting a, a project proposal to a committee, the key message is, I have the brightest idea you can imagine on this new model. I'm taking the best approach to solve the problem and you need to fund this because I have the best team to carry on this work. So, no, these are the things we need to understand here. So, what do we want to happen at the moment? Of course, depending on what we are doing, there can be some actions for the audience. Of course, you are presenting this for a committee. The audience is the committee. You don't want the committee to do anything. But if you are doing other kind of presentations, it may happen that you want the, the audience to do something. What do we want to happen in the future? If you are presenting a paper, you want the people to remember that you have presented a model for network slicing, for 5G. And you want them to want remember you that you have a best model, the best I'm exaggerating, of course, right? But you have a very good model, a very nice approach to solve the problem of network slides. And, of course, this means that we should have some topics to remember. What are the realistic goals? One of the things we can do, of course, if you go to a, a conference, and the conference is hundreds of people, you cannot carry a paper copy, sorry, you cannot carry a paper copy of your presentation for obvious reasons. But it's very good if you are presenting your thesis, whatever, to the committee, your research proposal to a committee, and you know the committee is five, six people, whatever, take a paper version of your presentation. The one that you have lines on the side, I can show you later on. The one that you have lines on the side for people to take notes. Because they will take this home. I mean, probably half of them would throw it to the garbage. But still, that's a good way for them to remember that you have been there. And they can take notes on the stuff that you have done. And this is a good way to keep an interaction to the committee. So, a copy of the presentation to take home. Then, another thing. What are the needs of the audience? Who are they? The list of people. 
you, you are presenting the, uh, uh, a proposal to a committee, you know the committee in advance, right? You know where these people are? Google them. See where they are from. Oh, this guy is from math. This guy is from chemistry. This guy is from engineering. Oh, okay. So they are not all mathematicians. So they have, they have different backgrounds, right? Do these kind of things. Because this will help you communicate with them. What do they want to know? You can imagine potential questions, right? Obviously. If you are submitting a research proposal, you can easily imagine questions that can you explain the better model or whatever it is, right? So this is very useful. One of the ways of doing this is that after you submit the proposal, before the presentation, you share it with colleagues and you start teasing each other, right? Playing the devil's advocate, so that you can imagine the questions and then this means you are prepared to give the answers already. What do they not accept? In academia there are things we don't accept. Plagiarism is one of them. So, of course, I mean, if you are presenting a research proposal or a paper or a thesis, plagiarism definitely should not be there. And this means that don't copy stuff from other people that is not being quoted, it's not being referenced and so on. Do we, knowing this in advance, we should not do it, of course. What do they want? Now, again, depends on the audience. They want, probably they want to evaluate us, to give us a mark, or they, again, in the conference, they just may be interested in our work. What is not familiar to them? Again, if this is a committee of chemi guys from chemistry, biology, and so on, don't start talking about complicated stuff, because they will not understand. Although it's your research proposal. I mean, can I start talking about you about network protocols and uh, interfaces and, uh, you know, I can start playing around here with a lot of acronyms and then you said, this guy went bananas, I don't understand what he's talking about, right? So, just tune your language to the audience that you have. If, of course, if you are presenting your paper in a conference of mathematicians, feel free to talk about all the stuff that you know, because the audience will understand you. But if you are going to present your research proposal to a team of people, to a committee that has different backgrounds, be careful to going too much into depth, into concept, concepts they may not know. What do they know? This means also that you should be prepared to give examples of things that are understandable for them. Right? So this means if you have someone from a medical doctor, I don't telling you that suddenly you start talking about diseases because you know nothing about disease. At least I don't know anything about disease. I'm very healthy, fortunately, so I usually say that I know nothing about diseases, right? not even on a personal basis. But okay, but then this means that probably you should pick some examples that has to do with health, so that they can better understand or biology or whatever. They can better understand what what you are. So how are you going to present these? Now, of course, this is general. That can be applicable in some cases or not. But basically, you should establish the problem. What is the problem we want to solve? What are the objectives we want to achieve by solving this problem? What we are doing to solve the problem, the approach, and then presenting results. So this is basically, if we want to present some work, this would be the structure that we need to have. And I'll be coming back to this in a few minutes with some more detailed information. So this means that I need to have an introduction and the introduction should establish a relationship with the audience. I need to call the attention of the audience to something again. I need to keep their interest. I need to present the message. And I do this by giving an outline. Which I'm going to capture your attention by saying I'm going to talk about the model for network slicing. If you are interested in network slicing, oops, I want to hear this. 
Then I have the main body of the presentation. Don't talk about everything again. It will be a problem without solution. Choose three, four, five topics, whatever needs to be done, and give evidence and examples. Because if you don't give evidence in science, it's very bad, especially in art sciences like we are, right? But humanistics, nothing against the colleagues from humanities, but you understand what I'm saying, right? So uh, give evidence of the things so that people can rely on you that you are really, really doing the right stuff because you are showing how it's done and not just general ideas. Which, I mean, it's okay to have general ideas, but again, I think you understand. And then conclusions. So this should be the structure of any presentation. You should have an introduction, then the main content, and then some conclusions. And the reason here is that here you are going to reinforce the message. You're coming back to the same message again. You introduce the message, you explain the message, and you re remind the message. This is a continuous effort that we are doing to call the attention to people to some things. And then there will be some actions or conclusions or whatever. This is the problem that you have when you are doing a presentation. Which is basically, in the beginning you are very attentive, then very slowly you start reading your emails and you disconnect. And only in the end, when someone says, now it's over, thank you for coming, you're like, oh, it's over, good, I did it, I passed it. Right? That's this point here. Until, until you did it's over, oh, you're already asleep. So the effort in doing a presentation is to prevent this from happening. You don't want this to happen in your presentation. Because if this happens, you're in trouble. Remember the remote control of the TV guys? Okay, you don't have a remote control, but you have your laptop or your mobile smartphone, whatever it is, and you start doing other stuff. So we need to prevent this from happening. How can this be done? So, let's do it. The outline should identify the key points of your presentation. It's the first opportunity that you have to call the attention for the message. Again. I'm developing a, a, net, a model for network slicing, which is very efficient. It saves 50% of resources. Oops, 50% is a good number. What percent? Ah, no one cares. One percent, it's fine. 50%? Ooh, that's a lot. What? That's my message. I'm developing a model for network slicing that saves 50% of resources. The guys with the money, oops, 50%, that will save a lot of money. I'm joking, but you understand that. So you need to take advantage of the beginning when people are attentive to capture their attention. Okay, this guy is developing 50%. Okay, I need to, to see how this is done because 50% is a lot. What? So now you start getting the attention of some people. So you need to do it here. It's the... Really, when people are very attentive. And now, how can we, again, how can we prevent this from happening? Okay, we want this to happen. So it will not be a, a, a uniform or a steady state, because it's human nature, right? It doesn't matter if you're Portuguese or Russian. You, it's human nature. I mean, human nature is like this. We get tired and so on. So that's, that's how it works. But we want this to happen instead of this. And how can we do it like this? Okay, so the first thing is give examples. Because if you give examples, people will be more attentive, right? It's not just very complex information, even for mathematicians, I believe. Tell a joke. I mean, you're not going to tell a joke if you are presenting a thesis, right? The, the, the committee will not look it very seriously. But, you know, if you're giving a presentation like this, ah, sometimes I can tell a joke, I can say something, because, oh, people laugh and so on, whatever. So, 
quote someone that is known. Right? This again captures the attention of people. Oh, this professor has done this. And, oh, okay. He knows this guy. Right? Establish an analogy. Give an example. Uh, I mean, I'm doing this network slicing. Oh, yes, because. 50% because it's very important. Even in former times, people did research in networks to optimize resources. So then I'm doing the same thing. So, oh, okay, this guy is continuing some work that is being done. Raise a question. Asking questions to the audience. It's a very good thing, right? Because suddenly you need to stop and start thinking. Oh, okay, what can be my question, answer to this question? Introduce visual elements. You probably have noticed that I don't have too much text in each page and I'm putting some figures in here and one of the main things is that you have enough time to read the information that I'm giving you while I'm talking. So you are not disconnecting, you don't have to choose between listening to me and reading the information because I don't have too much information. Because if I put too much information, you need to have a choice. Which is either you listen to me, or you read the information. You cannot make both intelligently at the same time. And using some, of course, depends on what you are presenting, though, obviously. But if you have something like this, then it will help people to, to ease it. And, of course, present a demonstration if you have something to present. Like a demonstration. If you put figures or whatever, it can help on raising attention to people because the information is not as strong as it is, right? I mean, it's just a few words and then you have something on the side. It's easier to read. It's easier to understand. Remember, the effort to capture the attention of people needs to be on the presenter, not on the audience. So I need to use any trick I know to capture your attention as an audience. And this goes from other things, which is, I need to, I mean, in science, I'm not talking about presentations in art, or in fashion, or these kind of things, right? Because these people will do completely different things. This here, we need to be very sober in what we do. We don't want to communicate the presentation itself. We want to communicate the message of the presentation. So I should not, I'll be presenting you a, a very short movie in a few minutes. But this means I should not have too many colors and all these kind of things, because this will distract people. You don't want people to be distracted by the way the presentation is being looked at. You want people to be focused on the content of the presentation, not on the way it's done. I was reading some months ago something about uh, classical music or whatever you want to call it, right? And why they are all dressed in black and white, right? You know this, right? You go to a concert and the, the orchestra is in black and white. And I was reading that even the ladies don't use their nails painted. And the whole thing is done for one single purpose. Do you know what it is? We want to capture the attention of the audience to the music. We don't want the audience to be distracted by the orchestra or the director. We want them to focus on the music. So we don't want them to start looking at the player or whatever, or because the lady has a dress. No, they are all the same, black and white. So it's, what's the point of looking at them? They look the same. Now I can listen to the music. And this is a little bit, see the analogy now? See, I'm doing the analogy. So this is a little bit what we are doing here. We want this to be very black and white, up to a certain point, because I don't want you to start, stop, why is he using this purple now, or this blue and yellow in the presentation? No, that's not the issue right here. I don't care about the colors. The colors are not important. And the conclusions then, again, remember, the conclusions is something that you need to the conclusions is something that you need to, again, your last opportunity to call the attention to the message. You need to take these to people to go back home, they're remembering you. 
Oh, yes, that was an excellent presentation. This guy, this model is 50%. I think I can even do 75 if I do it myself. I have some ideas now. So, this means also one thing, which is you need to prepare the presentation. You, you have to choose the information, as you have seen. Uh, there is, I don't know if you know, I was told it's one from a Portuguese writer. I don't know if it's true or not, but at least in Portugal it's told as being from a Portuguese writer of the 18th century or something like that. That he, once he wrote a letter to a friend which had 20 pages. And in the end, he finished the letter like, I, my apologies, but I did not have time to write a shorter letter. Because this is the point, right? If you want to just start writing something, you just write everything that comes to your mind. Then it's 20 pages, it's 30 pages, it's whatever you are thought to us. But then if you want to capture the attention, if you need to choose the information, it takes time, because you need to go through the work, the thesis, the project proposal, whatever it is, the paper, and you need to think, okay, for this audience, for these people, I need to choose these, I need to choose that. I have only 20 minutes. Oh, this is 25 minutes, I need to cut here, should I cut there? It takes time to do this. And you should take notes of what you want to say, what are the key aspects you want to say, write them down. PowerPoint even allows you to take notes. Don't read the text or the notes, because even if you don't speak good English, it's better that you say less, but what you say, you say it without an effort. It's very bad that you give a presentation and you start reading information. It's really very bad. Again, if you are not comf I'm not an, a Portuguese, so I'm not a native English speaker, but still, it's better that you say less, but what you say, you say it without effort. Because if you start reading, the audience will completely... Oh, okay. and if he's reading, I, I, he can send me the paper, right? I know read myself. I don't need him to, or her to read to me. I can read it myself. And you should rehearse the presentation before. Do it before your colleagues. Do it with the family. Whatever. Rehearse it in front of the mirror. Just present in front of the mirror. See how you react. Look at yourself doing the presentation. Because this can be very important in making a success when you are really preparing and afterwards doing the presentation. One other thing that should be done is also the location. Of course, sometimes you are in a conference, you cannot choose the location, right? But that's not the point. The point is, for example, if you can do it, then you should organize the proper setup. I could not do it here, right? I write here, here is this. Okay, no problem. But I came prepared with the memory stick. Because in case that my computer would not come here, I had the memory stick to put the information. And it would be very bad if I didn't have one. Because probably no one in the room has one, and then we probably would spend here 10 minutes connecting cables and it will never start, right? So be prepared for this kind of things, because this will help making it smoothly. And if you spend 10 minutes trying to arrange something, you are going to start your presentation already in a nervous state. So it didn't work, now I'm 10 minutes late, now I need to, to speak even less. Bad, this is bad, this is very bad. So think about it, bring your laptop, bring your memory stick, be prepared for whatever you need to do. You should speak loud, like I'm doing, clearly, I'm not sure if I'm speaking clearly, expressively, I mean, don't start waving your arms or whatever, but still, don't speak like this, right, because then it's not good. And not the monotonous tone. If you start talking like in a monotonous tone, like in this day, then you'll be very boring, because again, you start sleeping again, because this is not the way you should speak to an audience, of course, right? So, you need to speak lively and trying to 
again get the attention of people. You need to look at people, but in a friendly way. Can you imagine if I would spend the whole day looking at Igor? Would you be comfortable if I spend the whole afternoon looking at you? So just at Igor, no one else. Well, you guys start thinking, why is he looking at me? Right? <laughs> why, why is this happening? And Igor starts saying, why is he looking at me? What have I done? <laughs> you know, I was driving him yesterday, but he didn't complain, right? So what the hell happened here, right? So look at the audience. Don't focus on a certain person, but you know, try to share the looks with the audience. And also, the way you position yourself is very important. Here is the screen. I need to be by the screen. Because again, I want you to hear me, to see me, and to read the information. If I would be talking from here, this would be a problem, right? Because now you have to decide. Either you are going to read the information, or you are going to look at me. And it's going to be harder for you, here it comes again, it's going to be harder for you to follow the presentation. Because now you need to make a constant decision whether you look at the screen or you listen to me, look at me. So don't do that. So just come here and move gently. You don't need to rush from one place to the other or whatever, right, obviously. But, you know, here and do it here. Because again, the whole, remember, there are two things again. Choose information and the effort needs to be on our side. These are the two key messages of doing a good presentation. And the effort is on my side. I need to capture, I'm here, guys, look at me, look at me. That's, that's the same model. So, why do we have to choose information? Oh, we can choose information because, because, we are prepared to answers after the presentation. And we can have a lot of support material afterwards. And we can take advantage of questions to present some further stuff without speaking 20 more minutes on something, of course. Right? But this can be something that you... So you should prepare some additional material with, again, the key stuff that you think that is very important or be ready to answer to questions that you think that they will ask. Depends now on what you are doing. Don't give another presentation after you, because then, especially in a committee, right, in a conference, even the chair of the, co of the session can go, oh, just stop, 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 go outside and so on. This is not good, right? But even if you are in a committee, then it's even worse. Because then the guys, I'm talking too much, I mean, they told me to shut down, oops. So the guys in the committee are not happy if someone is telling you, okay, that's enough. You, you, it's enough. Oops. The guys are not happy with you now, right? You don't want this to happen. So give concise replies. Of course, answer the questions, obviously. And be prepared to give in a conference, for example, to give the details in a break. If you are really people interested in your work, talk to them in the break, or they will come to you in the break. They don't need to do this during the presentation. Okay, so this is the first part. Do you have any questions for now? Should I stop here or do you want me to continue? Of course, we are asking you to continue. This is very boring, I can stop, of course. <laughs> it was very impressive and interesting. So let me then... So, now I'm giving you a presentation on how to do presentations. Right? So, guides for a good presentation. I'm presenting the title, my name, my affiliation, and I have here the logos of the institutions, doesn't matter. So, the first thing is the outline. Remember the outline? I have the outline now for you. So, I'm going to talk about how to give a good presentation. I'm going to tell you about the basic principles of doing a presentation, the structure of a presentation, the sizes and the contrast of the information, of the written information, the style that should be used. I'm giving you some examples, and I'll be presenting some conclusions. So this is the outline of my presentation. 
One of the things you should not do is to keep presenting the outline. Because this will occupy time that you don't have. Remember, you need to choose information. So, presenting the outline repeatedly is time that you are occupying, that you should be occupying in presenting other information. You don't want to repeat yourselves with this information. You give it once and that's it. Don't repeat it. So, what are the basic principles of doing a presentation? So, let's see, this is my introduction now. What? Right? So, the presentation of work is intended to present the major aspects of the work, not the whole work. So, again, it comes back one of the base messages. And, as I told you, because you cannot present the whole information, you cannot present the whole work, again, being a research paper, a thesis, a project proposal, whatever it is. Selling a car, I don't think you, anyone in the room will be selling a car, but still, we cannot do it. And one should, again, the key message here is that we have to choose the most important results, the most important information for the presentation. And we, we are presenting our work, right? So we know it much better than anyone else, because, for obvious reasons, because we have done it ourselves. So we are the guys in power to make this choice, not the other people. If we have some written paper or something like that, the presentation in the audience or the committee has already written it, we should follow the same structure. Because if we don't, then the people, the committee will be... Sorry, I've read this now, where is this information? Suddenly people start thinking, where is the information I've read, right? So don't do that. If you're presenting a paper, or again, a thesis or a project proposal, follow the same structure. Because if you don't, again, you are putting the effort on the audience. You don't want to do that. And a very easy metric of trying to design, trying in the sense of having a sketch, a draft of the presentation, is that you should have basically one page, one to two pages per minute of presentation. So if you are going to talk for 30 minutes, don't prepare a presentation with 100 pages. Because definitely you will run into trouble. Because you cannot present, you cannot give a good presentation of 20 minutes with 100 pages. For, unless you have a very specific case that can happen. When the audience is composed of a small group of people, three, four, five people, whatever, then give them, again, this paper copy of some lines on the side. I can show you what it is. Basically, it's three pages of presentation and then a four page. There's, if you go to PowerPoint, you have a, pre a printing mode, which is three pages with lines on the side. That's the one you should use. This enables people to write comments, to put questions, to take notes on your presentation, and that's a good way for them to remember that you were there, that you have this model for network slicing, that will save 50% of the resources, or whatever you are doing. The structure now. So what is the structure of the presentation? So you should have a cover, cover page, the outline, introduction, motivation, objectives, then all the development and conclusions. So whatever presentation you do, follow these. Again, a cover page, an outline, introduction, motivation, objectives, depending now what you are presenting, then all the things and then conclusions. And in some cases you can put your contacts after the conclusions. So that people can remember if you are for an audience that don't know. This is things like this, right? So what should be in the cover page? The title of the work, the names of the authors and the affiliations. The title of the work, the names of the authors and the affiliations. This is your cover page. Don't put too many colors. Don't put too many things. It will distract people. Right? Just put really the important stuff. 
the, when you go to a shop to buy clothes, do they put all the clothes on the shop? No, right? Or shoes. Do they put all the shoes on the shop? On the window shop, I mean, on the window shop? Of course they don't, right? They pick two or three to attract the attention of customers. All the rest is inside. They just want to attract our attention to go inside, at least for the ladies. I think for the men it doesn't work too much that way. But still, right? They just want to attract the attention of people to go inside and buy the stuff. They are not to put everything here. So that's what we have to do here. It's just to attract the attention of people. We don't want to put everything in here. The outline. It's one page, the outline. Should not be more than one page, for obvious reasons, again, because you don't have too much space or time to do these. It should contain the main topics. You don't need to describe everything. One, one dot two, one dot three, one dot... Forget it. Don't do that. Don't do it. Just the main topics. The main topics are these. See? One, two, three, six topics. These are the topics. I don't need to go into details now. The details will come later on. It should not be then a full list of things. Again, it's just the main ideas, the main topics you are doing for the presentation. So, now, this means that uh, it depends very much on the specific presentation you are doing. But these introduction motivation objectives can be all in one page, can be one page for each. Now, of course, it depends on the specific specificity of your presentation. But I would say that usually you should not have more than one page for each of these things. Because again, you are not lecturing. This is not a three hours or a one hour and a half class or whatever it is. You have 20 minutes, you have half an hour, you have seven minutes. You need to choose information. You need to choose information. You should introduce the area of the work and how it's placed in a more global perspective. That's usually what is expected when you are giving a scientific presentation. Why is it interesting to work on network slicing? Why is it important? Even if you are doing research for the sake of research, meaning blue sky research, as we say, it's not very applied. Still, I have an idea. Why do you want to explore that idea? Because you, you feel like, is that it? Is that the only reason? No, come on, there's something else behind it. You want to do something before exploring an idea. Because it's new, because no one thought about it, because there are people with problems, then you will have people to solve problems. There is some motivation, some idea why you are doing it, right? So give it to the audience, explain to the audience why you are doing this. And not, you are doing, oh, because I need to fill in my, we are working hours, I have several hours per day, I need to do something, I'm doing this. I'm, this will not excite anyone, right? People will do, okay, then continue to do that. Bye bye. I'm going home. So, motivation, objectives. Objectives should be listed and indicating the main goals. I'm doing network slicing this model because I want to save resources. My goal is to save 50% of the resources. That's my objective. Sometimes, I don't know, this is not possible always, but as much as possible, objectives should be measurable. I'll be coming back to this for, because of the research proposals. You should be capable of measuring them, putting a number in it. Because this will happen, being in an audience of mathematicians, this will have people to look at the things. Of course, you can have models, but in the end you have results. Of course, it depends on the mathematics, of course, as well, but that's not what we are discussing now. Then on the development. So, I should explain the models or algorithms or whatever I'm doing. I need to describe them and how they have been implemented. I need to assess them. This is very important in science, as you know. Because I can have a very nice model, even if it is an analytical model. The model, of course, I mean, if it's analytical, I can prove it's right, right? That's not the issue. But when I've implemented it, 
when I've did the programming or in MATLAB or whatever, maybe I've done an error and I don't notice it. The problem is not of the model, the problem is of the implementation. So I need to assess the results. I need to compare my results with something else to check if my model and its implementation are correct. Because probably the model, of course, is okay, but then when I put it in MATLAB, I put a minus instead of a plus somewhere, and I have completely wrong results. And if I'm not going to assess the models, the, the results, then I'm doing a huge mistake. And then the worst that can happen is that I'm going to a conference, or I'm presenting my thesis, or my research proposal, and go, oh, but don't you see that is wrong? Of course it's wrong. I mean, this is, oops. What am I going to do now? This is not what you want, right? You don't want this to happen, definitely not. You need to analyze the results, and in engineering, I'll come back to this in a minute, or in a few minutes, in engineering this means that you should have a relative and an absolute analysis, both of the results. Numbers per se, okay, mathematicians, numbers are numbers, doesn't matter. But for engineers, numbers are not numbers, they need to have a meaning. So, no, just numbers by itself, I don't care. I, mean, I need to have numbers with a meaning. So, of course, for you, this is not the case. And uh, identify the main results. What are really the important stuff that, again, is the key result? It's 50%. I'm saving 50%. Guys, remember this? 50%. Do you want to know what 50% is? Increase your taxes 50%. Are you happy? No. So that's 50%, right? Yeah. Explain people what 50% is, because sometimes they don't understand what 50% is. Oh, I have a small question. Yes. As far as I understand from the previous slide, you told that uh, uh, objective should be measurable. Yes. Yes. It's better. It's better that the objective should be measurable. Yes. Uh, something I can calculate, for instance. Yes. So let's speak about the throughput of the network. So throughput modeling cannot be objective, but throughput evaluation can be. Yes. It's better. It's better, yes? Mm -hmm. To put uh, the evaluation as about objective, but not modeling. Yes. No, you can have, you can have the objective is to have a model but, uh, to save resources. Yes, and, and then the modeling is uh, the goal of the development of something of methods yes. and so yes. on. Yes. But again, this is the engineering but, perspective. Yes, because from the engineering point of view, of course. Yes, yes. That's, I'm talking as an engineer. The, uh, I said this. Theoretical mathematics, for instance. Yes, of yes. Then, of course. Of if you are from algebra, mm -hmm. this does not apply. Right? Yes. If you are from algebra, is there for anyone from algebra in the room? I don't know. If you are from algebra, you have groups, you have corps, you have sets. You don't have objectives like this, right? You, Hilbert spaces, whatever you have. I mean, that's a different thing, of course. But I'm, again, and you are applied mathematicians, as you know, so you are... I, I, I'm going to say something which is very awkward, but I, you're probably even closer to, to engineers than to the guys from Algeria. Sorry, sorry. But, again, that depends on the kind of work you are doing, obviously. Okay. Again, the same thing. Before actually preparing the presentation, it should be structured. So do a sketch, do a draft. I want to do this, I want to talk about this, I need to show this, and then start filling it up and figure it in. So, okay, in order to, I want to present these results, I want to present the model, I want to do this, I want to do that. And then you can start preparing the presentation. So it should be structured on the side, identify the key aspects you want to show and then you start filling it in. One of the things I don't like what students do these days is that I don't allow them, let me, allow me to say like this, I don't allow them to start programming whatever they want to do without first having the flow charts and the structure of the model. Because then it, they are going to waste their time, right? If they haven't structured the model, if they don't have the flow charts and all these kind of things, if they, of course, they want to start programming as fast as possible. But then it's, they are wasting their time, because they have not structured their minds, they have not structured the information. So they, they will need to come back 
it will be a trial and error process that will be very lengthy. They are paying themselves with time on these, these errors. It's basically like that. Sizes and contrasts. Each page should contain a few short sentences. See, not too many. Remember this. So headers should be written in, I mean, I'm giving here an example. It's Times New Roman 44 points or equivalent. Large font on the header. You don't want a small font here. The text, the rest of the text, slightly smaller. Let, don't use fonts less than 28 points. If you do that, people, okay, this is a small room. You go to a large room, people will not be capable of reading what you have shown. If they are not capable of reading it, why are you giving the presentation? You might as well show some pictures or drawings, abstract stuff, because anyway, the purpose is the same. They are not capable of understanding what you're showing. Right? So, I mean, go get some pictures. Maybe to show the complexity of the work that was done. For example, some diagrams with, with no. many elements, with many details. It's very complex work. If the goal of your presentation is to show complexity, then it's okay. But still people need to, to understand the complexity, right? <coughs> if you want just to show a big equation, to show that is a, a big equation, okay, but don't you want to explain the equation to people? Just want to show that the equation is big? That's a choice you have to make, right? Yes, yes. That's a choice. That's a choice you have to make. The color of the text should make a clear contrast with the background, so you can easily read the information. Sometimes people use backgrounds, and then you can read half of the text, basically. And all the information should be about the same size. So if you put, the, I mean, the difficulty of reading graphs or equations or tables is the same, right? So if you put a lot of things, again, people will not be capable of reading it. The style should be coherent and uniform. Don't have one page in Times of the Roman, the other page in Arial, the other page in Calibri or all these fonts. One with a large letter, one in a small letter, one in red, one in blue. Remember, the orchestra is black and white. No colors there. You don't want the musicians to capture your attention. They are playing music. They are not there to be seen. Right? So your presentation is here to send a message, not to start people wondering why you have changed the font from Times of Roman to Calibri. It doesn't matter. I mean, that, that's, who cares about this? What? Use complete phrases. Don't put topics, because topics means people will not capture the ideas. Sentence should be complete. The subject, the verb, blah, blah, blah. Because if you don't do this, the message will not be complete. People will not understand what you're talking about. Avoid acronyms. I think in math you don't have too much of this problem. This is more an engineering problem. In engineering we tend to use a lot of acronyms. And then people don't understand what you're talking about. Again, I think in math you don't have this problem. In engineering it's terrible, I tell you. You go to many conferences and you see a lot of acronyms there and I have no idea what these guys are talking about. Because I'm not from that specific area, so I just don't understand. I'm lost. I'm completely lost. Do not present references in the work. I, I know that in, in math probably you, sometimes you tend to do this, but in, if at least in engineering we don't. We assume that, again, you are presenting your thesis. You are presenting a paper. You are presenting a research proposal. These people have access to the written information. I don't want to occupy my presentation, which has just the key, the most important stuff, with references. And I'm telling them, if you want to see the references, go to the written information. I'm not going to put any references in there. None. Zero. Unless there's a very important one for some reason. Sorry, Julia. 
Do not present very complex equations. <laughs> Thank you for your advice. With a difficult description. I mean, you can present equations, but then you need to explain them, right? I'm giving you some examples in a few minutes. At least, again, remember I told you, this is the engineer speaking. So, my apologies if not everything that I'm telling you is applicable to you, but I try to. Each page should contain a title that is related to its contents. Do not repeat the titles, and if we need, we just put numbers to differentiate. So it makes it easier for people to follow what we are talking about. But don't start saying results, 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 results. And then you have 50 pages, results, results 30, results 31, results, come on, results. What kind of results are you showing? Dependence on user intensity, uh, evaluation of probabilities. Okay, these are results, but then I understand what the content. Results, results, results. I'm lost. Include a reference to the source when using figures from other sources. Plagiarism. Remember plagiarism? These days we tend to go to the internet, copy a lot of stuff that is not ours, and not putting the reference. We need to put that. Because if we don't, we are stealing information. You are using a photo, a graph of something that is not ours, and we are presenting it as being ours. You probably noticed, if you didn't, let me show it to you. You probably noticed that in my previous presentation, see, I'm always putting the source. So you can, if you want to use it, you can Google it, see? Of course, if you are presenting your own research, most probably you don't have this problem because you have done all the, the graphs and all the figures. But if this is not the case, then you know, you have to put, you have to put the reference. Uh, you can use this as a template, meaning I'm, what I'm doing here, I'm applying what I'm telling you for all these reasons. This is for the students, I'm sorry about this. Okay, this is, I would call, a bad example for text. Why is it a bad example? It's full of information, too much information. You start reading these, and you already lost, right? This is small, so people in the back can still read it, but if this would be a larger room, you would not read it. So this is not a good page. This is also very bad, right guys? Because see, I'm using the background, can you read this? No, I mean, you can if you make an effort. Again, wrong, Woo! wrong. The effort has to be mine, not yours. So this is, you should not do it. I mean, it may be nice, you know, to show a whole telephone, but this should not happen because people will not understand what's in there. It's not easy to read. Now, you can present equations, right? But say, the problem can be expressed by a Markov chain. P is this, lambda is that. Now I can spend two minutes here explaining all of these. Probably I don't need even to have the list of all parameters, depends on how it goes. But I can explain these and everyone can read these, right? So. This is a good example. I'm sorry, but I consider this a very bad example. It's small, right? Not everyone, if it's a large room, not everyone will be capable of reading all these things, right? It's full of information. And what, what am I gaining by put, doing this? If I really need to present this, I, it, there is a very simple solution. I just increase the size and I'll be presenting each one in a different page. I don't need to put all in the same page. The amount, what is important here is the amount of information. The amount of information, having this in one page or in four pages with the largest size is the same. And if I split this in four pages with the largest size, everyone will read it. If I do it like this, 
the people on the back and so on will not read it and it's too much information, you disconnect. Because you stop. Forget it. I'm lost. A table. See? By the way, this is the part of the history of mobile communication. See? All acronyms. Do you understand these acronyms? No. You know these acronyms? A lot of them. Really? Some. UMTS. Ah, UMTS. <laughs> this one. You know this GSM. one? GSM. GSM. Ah, yeah. Do you know too? Okay, that's very good. CDMA1. CDMA1. CDMA1, yes. yes. Now, this is the, 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 the history. Now it's even LTE and so on. Right? But see, this is a table you can read, right? Okay, it has the acronyms problem. This is where the names of the systems anyway. But you can read. These are the when it was launched, the countries, and so on. You can read this table. Now, can you read this table? No, of course. I mean, even if you even if you can read the numbers, because you are closer here, you're lost. You're completely lost in this table, aren't you? It's full of numbers, of acronyms, of lists. No one knows what this is. You're completely lost. You are not going to follow this. If you want to highlight something in here, just pick one case and show it. But don't show this whole table. Or if you want to show this, I'll be telling you how it's done in a minute. Or I can be done. What's it's done? It can be done. So a nice figure again. Okay, some colors. Not to say that engineers are boring, only, only black and white. So engineers also use colors some once in a while, right? But still, you can use it. I'm not very particularly fond of these fonts, but it's okay, that, that was something worth giving to me. This is a good graph, I would say. So, you have these, you can read, you have the caption on the side. We, okay, there's an acronym, but I can explain what the acronyms mean. Very important. There should be a sentence explaining the figure. When you have a figure, what is the message you want to convey with the figure? Not in the title of the... Paper. The title is a different thing. Because the title has two or three words. And the message, probably you cannot give the message with two or three words. You need one or two lines in a sentence. Right? Yes. So it's, a, it's a matter of size, if you want, or space, whatever. So put the sentence, one, two lines, explaining the message of that figure. The, what is the key conclusion of the figure? I mean, the probability is larger than these, or there's not a strong dependence with the number of users, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Help people to read the figure and give them the message, the key message you want to convey with this figure, you want to explain with the figure. Put the sentence there. So that helping people, what, is, what do you want to explain with that figure? What do you want to show? What is the message you want to tell to people? This is a nice figure, right? Of course, it's not real because mobile phones don't have these things, but they tend to have. See, the, it's not mine. I took it from somewhere else. This is a bad one, right? The sentence is on the back, on the bottom, sorry. This is bad. Why is it bad? Because if you are in an audience like this, the people on the back usually cannot read the bottom. So you should put the sentence on the top, not on the bottom. And a lot of empty space in here, see? Why am I leaving all this empty? And then probably the people on the back cannot read this, because it's too small. So, not, not a good thing to do. What are the conclusions here? See, the conclusions. Now I'm reaching the conclusions of the, of the presentation. So, this presentation, what, what is the intended here? I have developed a model to save network slicing. This presentation gives some basic principles for a good presentation of a work. The main topic. Now, the content. The structure should be similar to the one of the work. What are the key messages? Fonts should be large enough so that it's easy to read the text. Graphics and so on, the size, the effort stuff. Sentence should be short and complete with well-defined ideas. Again, the same thing. Each presentation, each page should correspond to one minute. And then, my contacts. 
So if you want to contact me afterwards, you have my name again, in case you have forgotten me in the meantime. My phone number, you have my email and my website, you can contact me. You want to know about my papers and all my research, go there. I'm not going to put them in the presentation. Is anyone here that does not have a computer with internet access? Of course, it's a stupid question. So I, I don't need to show that I'm the best guy in the world. I'm not, anyway. By listing hundreds of papers. If you are interested in my work, go there. And I have a website with this. And I've saved the time for capturing the attention for the things. Okay? So we should do a break, right? Mm, yes, for yes. about 15 minutes, maybe. Yes, but before we do a break, I want to show you something now. This is how we communicate. Today. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. This is what we don't want. This. Uh, oh, okay. It's so this is a. I got it from YouTube. And this is a. You know what? The United States, they have something they call stand up comedy. You know what it is? It's just one guy talking and telling jokes. So this is a guy, he's a former engineer. He had to be, right? And then now he's, I mean, a, a colleague showed me this. So he's a former engineer and he retired or whatever it happened to him. And now he does stand-up comedy, stand comedy on uh, doing presentations. What I tell people all the time, this is how we communicate in today's world, okay? This is what we don't want. <laughs> This is typically called life or death by PowerPoint, right? We've all, we think in PowerPoint now. I was actually, I, this is a true story. I was in, uh, driving through Colorado a couple years ago. I hit a patch of ice on I-70 coming out of the Eisenhower Tunnel going like, you know, 65, 70, maybe 90 miles an hour. <laughs> and I started spinning at top speed and my life flashed before my eyes and I swear to you, it was in PowerPoint. <laughs> and how bad is PowerPoint? Got? This is actually the number of PowerPoint presentation, presentations per day. Look at that, it's 43 million per day in uh, 2007, 54 million in 2008, 69 uh, million this year, 88 million per day next year. Now I looked at this chart, look at that is growing, you know, exponentially. I looked at this chart, here's Homeslow Crozier's flight for a year. You see, that's going about the same way. I realized that PowerPoint actually caused the mortgage meltdown. <laughs> so this is a thing I do, I do called Life After Death by PowerPoint. Basically, don't do these things with PowerPoint. These are the things that people do that drive me nuts. And the only way to show them not to do this is to show them what not to do. So the, the biggest one I see, the most common PowerPoint thing, number one, people tend to put every word they're going to say on their PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Although this eliminates the need to memorize your talk, open mistakes or slides, crowded, worry, and worry, you lose your audience's attention before you can reach the bottom of your first slide. <laughs> common. Now, font size is important. Size matters. Too small, and that's not that's not good for anybody. On the other hand, too big and you don't get more. <coughs> you just look like an idiot. Uh, don't have your fonts moving. Keep your text stationary. There's nothing more annoying than text that does it. Blinking, don't have it blinking, don't have it spinning, don't have stuff flying around the screen. You drive people with ADD crazy, you're just like, oh, what's happening? Oh. Now, since I'm talking about fonts, people are really into fonts. I've noticed this. Here's a great, here's a, uh, by the way, this is uh, uh, one of the best joke jokes that I know. A uh, uh, Comic Sans and uh, Helvetica are walking to a bar. <laughs> and uh, ask the bartender for a drink, and the bartender says, Sorry, we don't serve your type here. <laughs> that kills at a font convention, guys. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. It's a type. I get it. <laughs> choose, be very careful. Everybody has their, their favorite font. The font you choose sends a message about who you are as a person. There's a long list of fonts. We pick one. That reflects our personality. We're sending an unspoken message. So, for example, if you choose Carrier New, it means you're organized and structured. And like to pretend you're still using a typewriter. <laughs> if you choose Comic Sans, it means you think you're funny. And if you choose Times New Roman, it means you're lazy, apathetic, and unimaginative, and you always use the default. <laughs> If you choose uh, Georgia, uh, it means you speak with a southern accent. If you choose uh, Ariel, it means uh, you like the Little Mermaid. Oh, a lot of Ariel people. If you choose Old English, it means uh, you enjoy malt liquor. Uh, 
Uh, we got a few more. Helvetica? Helvetica? That means uh, you're a mayonnaise lover. <laughs> That's a stretch. Oh, but that is a stretch. Uh, Black Adder? That means you're an African American accountant. <laughs> that one requires some thought. <laughs> Sorry. And if you like wingdings, it means you're a nerd and you have no life. <laughs> now, uh, if you type in all small letters, some people do that, all small letters, that means you're quiet, shy, and unassertive. <laughs> If you type in all capital letters, that means uh, you yell a lot. There's somebody over there. If you type in a small letter followed by capital letters, it means uh, your cat flock is stopped on. <laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? Usually going along for a while, you look up, oh darn! And then finally, you've got a mix of capital letters and small letters, that means uh, this is a ransom note and you are a kidnapper. <laughs> Avoid excessive bullet pointing, only bullet key points. Too many bullet points, and your key messages will not stand out. In fact, the term bullet point comes from people firing guns at annoying presenters. <laughs> this slide, by the way, has crashed PowerPoint. Apparently, there's, there's a max about how many bullet points you can have. Like, I said, that's good. The other thing you can do is have animations. People love animations. They have to go zooming in and out and left and right. You get seasick watching some of these. And, Turns out if you're a visual learner, your effectiveness is people will go up with the more animation. But if they're easily distracted, they are not even paying attention to what you're saying. They're just watching the cool stuff. And there's regions to this graph. There's the simple but effective region, the active but confusing, the uh, effective but boring, the uh, active but ineffective, the dull but static region, the uh, busy but useless region over there, the ADD only region there up in the corner, <laughs> the useful amusing, the stupid confusing, the double triangle, the hyper triangle, the uh, sleepy square, the dizzy pentagon, and then everything else is just grouped into what's called pointless motion. <laughs> This one slide, by the way, took me three and a half weeks to make. It's true. It's also, PowerPoint can suck the light, buddy. Now, one of the biggest dangers today, and I'm telling you, I, I hear it more and more every time I hear a conversation, is what I call SAOD, or Severe Acronym Overload Disorder. <laughs> Have you heard people talk recently? There are no words going between, yeah, I am my CFO about our ROI and our CRM and our RFP, and it turns out our EPS is really SOL, so we better do something ASAP. <laughs> Like, can I buy a vowel? I can't solve your conversation. <laughs> and I made up this resume, but this could be a real resume in today's world. Look, I got an MBA from USC, an MSWE from MIT, a BSEE from uh, DU. I worked at uh, IBM, HP, VLS. I remember VI, triple E, EIT, NCAA, NAACP, AARP, AA, triple A. I want a position as CEO, COO, CFO, CIO, CTO, CMO, CSO, CPO, CYO, BP, EPP, or EIEIO. I want I want to be the EIEIO of a company someday. It's actually my dream. Hi, I'm the EIEIO. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Call me on McDonald's. That's all right. Now, I've got my final point, uh, and this people do all the time. They'll just have graph after graph just to impress you with their, with their graph prowess. And uh, I chose uh, acronym usage. This is my real time acronym usage. It pretty much goes up and down. I don't know why you need the graph, but you can see pretty much peak there. I'll use some more acronyms later. And uh, there's just a chart that doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense to you, but I just want to impress you. Here's a, uh, an acronym letter distribution C's, I's, E's, N's, and S's are the most common letters that I use in my acronyms. Here's a uh, uh, pie chart uh, letter distribution. That's an, and here's, I have no idea what you use that for, but. Uh, you can generate that automatically in PowerPoint. Uh, so I figured what the heck it did. Uh, here's a line graph that I'm line graphs throughout my show. Here's a uh, bar chart number of bar charts. Pretty much goes up and down. Here's a uh, real bar chart. A beer line. It's kind of bar chart I'm into. Here's a candy bar chart. Uh, here's a salad bar chart. Tomatoes, sprouts, spinach, and the different calories of each. Here's a sushi bar chart. This is a probability of illness, uh, depending on the. Uh, there's a lot of detail in my act. Uh, here's a bar chart of the bars, business versus age throughout my life. Most people don't take the time to do this, but uh, you can see when I was 17, I had the fake ID, so uh, it was confiscated when I was 19, and my bar usage dropped dramatically. <laughs> I spent way too long making these charts. Uh, when I was 21, I went nearly every day of the year. You can see it was about 342. It's kind of gone down through the years. I plan to drink a lot when I'm 40, a lot when I'm 50, and then retire and drink constantly. That's my plan. <laughs> Uh, here's a spreadsheet of spreadsheets, get back to the charts. Here's a uh, spreadsheet of spreads, butter, margarine, I can't believe it's not butter, mayonnaise, French onion, cheese whiz, and Patriots plus five over cults. <laughs> Every possible spread you can imagine. Here's an order chart of org charts, and my main org chart, my sales, marketing, engineering org chart. Uh, here's your uh, reorg chart, every company should have those. Uh, 
And now this is interesting. This is my actual family work chart. Make one of these. It's important. Uh, Steve, our cat, runs our family. If you have a cat, you know that is true. Any animal that goes, hey, I just pooped in there. Somebody clean that up. <laughs> Clearly head of the family. My wife, Laura, reports to Steve. I report to my wife, and the remote control reports to me. That's, That's my entire region of domain right there. Uh, back to the charts again. Here's a pie chart of uh, chart types, 3D charts, uh, bar charts, pie charts. Here's a uh, pie chart of chart pies for dessert. Lemon, pumpkin, cherry, pecan, apple. Here's a uh, pizza pie chart. Uh, here's your pot pie chart. Uh, there's a better pot pie chart. <laughs> here's a pie chart with values of pi for the nerds out there. Yeah, 3.14159, 227, 3.14, and uh, pi itself. Uh, here's a, we have a pie chart I was thinking, why don't we have uh, a cake chart? So there's a cake chart. <laughs> why don't we leave the cake out? There's a, a birthday cake chart. There's a wedding cake chart. Uh, there's a bun cake chart. Uh, an upside down cake chart, and then really that's an upside down cake chart. And, uh, all right, I think I've covered all the charts. Any questions at this point? Okay. So let's have a break. Yes. Yes. And then we we'll yes. continue. Okay. And references. So where are the conclusions? It's about the same thing, right? And okay, you want to show the publications? It's fine. Now let me show you the other one. So this was the one that, again, was sent to me. I will go very quickly through this one, just as a reminder. It is a presentation made by my students, bachelor yes. students, Faina and Alessia, okay. for this conference. So th th this, I was sent these, again, just very fast, and I will show you what I will do, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Oh, oh. I ask you. So I will do the cover page like this. No pictures? No. But it is the respect to the conference. I show the, the title of the conference, the dates, and oh, okay. the you can do it. location. It's okay. But I would not... I want to get people's attention to the title and my names. Uh -huh. And of course, the affiliation. Uh -huh. Then an outline. Uh -huh. I will not, I'm not going to show this again, right? But the outline is the introduction. For example, it will be the features and millimeter systems in 3GPP and your radio. The system model, the mathematical model, the numerical analysis, and the conclusions. This is the outline. I would not show it again because I want to show other things. I would not repeat this. Then I would have an introduction, which it doesn't have here. But is the framework, the motivation, and so on. Because this, this is not the motivation, right? You start immediately with very a lot of information here. And I would put some lines of text explaining people the concept and the framework without already very complicated, because this is full of information already. And people will start, where am I? I mean, lot of information. And the other thing is that I would put some bullets to make it easier for people to read, because So this was the original, right? Okay, this one is seven bullets, but sometimes they don't have it, and it's not easier to read. Uh -huh. So let me go to the next one. Okay, this one has this. When I don't have a bullet, I'm not sure if this is a, a sentence or two sentences. What? Yes. yes. That's the problem. So again, I'm already thinking something that I shouldn't. It should be easy for me to understand what's in there. And. Okay, I, I'm destroying this presentation because I've not read the paper. But if this has been shown once, I would not show it again. If this has been if, if it's here, I'm going to explain it here, right? It is some break, of course. Yes. So I'm not going to show the figure again because it's going to distract people. 
So the next page, I would not show this meaning. What? I would not show it the second time. It's the same figure. And again, I would not put this because it really doesn't matter if it's figure one or three or four. I'm here to explain this to people. Again, I would not repeat the outline. The assumptions. Okay, I would explain the assumptions now. Let's remember sentences must be complete and so on. Multicast says and transparent service. What does it mean? I will tell the audience all the put the sentence here explaining. Are you considering the transparent surface? Transparent services are not being considered. Are they important? I don't know. Transparent service? It should be explained on the next slide. What, how, how can I uh, put it here? See, see the next slide? It's not self-contained here. I, I, I'm reading these. I don't know what, what it means. It would be overloaded. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And mm -hmm. It should have bullets to make it easier for people to read. Uh-huh. Then let's go to these. Ah, uh, yes, yes. This is the explanation of what is multicast, so, multicast this is, file service. Yes, this is the explanation. But then here we don't have a sentence describing the figure. Uh -huh. And even the parameters that you have described, some of them are not fully described in the, in the presentation. A lot of them are not fully described, yes. So. You are not coherent here. You are describing just a few of the parameters, not all of them. Right? Right. So is it or is it not important to describe the parameters in the written text? Either you describe them or you don't, right? Because this is full of, it's XI, it's U of U, but when I go through the presentation, I don't know in the end what it means because it's not written here. Yes, some of them should be put on this slide. And, okay, this is another page. Okay, this is... Again, this is another one that I would put the sentence describing here. And here you are describing the parameters, which is fine. But then what's VFT or VT? It's not there. Right? It isn't very important. Something is missing. Excuse me? This parameter it was not very Don't put important. it. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. It's not important, don't put it there. If it's not important, yes. right, it's the, don't put it there. It's, uh, again, this has not been described, right? Okay, let's skip this. Few, okay, I would not put this. Uh -huh. But what is lambda, what is mu, these things have not been described, right? Uh -huh. And the other thing is that I would not write it. You have here, and then you have these. And I'm a little bit lost what it means. I would put it this way. Parameters. Mathematical modeling. Ah. Then I can explain all these things. But then I'm repeating myself because these these have been explained previously, right? Yes, of course, but so I'm, I'm repeating information. Repeat. I'm repeating information now. Now, this is the challenge. <laughs> so what do I do with a graph like this? A kind of Markov chain. I do this. You want to you want to show it's complex? Okay, this is a nice figure to show it's complex. But then the people on the back will not be capable of reading these. Right? So do this. You take this one, you magnify it, and now you can explain it. And everyone in the back can read it. 
And then, of course, once you explain one of them, the others is just n, n plus 1, s plus 2, whatever it is, right? Do you, want to do you need really to explain all of them? No, no, no. Of course not. Of course not. You just need to explain one of them, right? Yes. The arrivals and the departures and the states and so on. So you can do this with this one. Yes. Excellent idea. And you solved the problem of the size of the font. Uh -huh. So you see, you can have complexity. Yes. And you show my complexity. Yes. <laughs> OK, then this is just a Again, I would not put all of this information here, too crowded. I would split, sorry, I would split in two different pages, like this. So that it's easier for people to understand. So this, instead of, I'm leaving the purple there because this is the latest presentation, I'm joking. <laughs> I think the color is wrong. I would not use it, but okay, I think it's. Too much color there. Again, you are, remember the orchestra, right? Black and white. So I would not do it like this, right? Too much information. I would do it like this. Okay, then here, a lot of parameters, but I don't know what they are for because they are not using the equation. Transmitter power. There's no transmitter power here. I don't know why it's listed there. Uh, G and T, antenna gains, they are not here. On the other hand, there's a CB here that is not listed. So, something or, or is... Or why it's I can't find something which is inside the equations. It's very often the case, but not at this slide, of course. And so I, and even the sentence, I would put it this way. To find coverage solving 12, uh, don't, again, don't number the equations. I think you, you are giving a presentation. It's not a paper with the equations number. I would put it like this. Coverage is defined by this leading to this, and then you explain. Uh -huh. What? Uh -huh. It's enough. And you explain, okay, now I equate this equation on RH. I invert to RA, AA, sorry, RA, and then this is, of course, uh -huh. that's it. Okay, I think. Uh, no? uh, okay, let's skip these now. The, the graphs. Mm -hmm. So this is now there is a uh, an engineering problem here, which I will explain in a minute. But let's before that. You have two graphs, right? The people. These are. This is too small. Probably the people in the back will not be capable of reading. So I would do it in a different way. I would have this one here, and the other one is almost superimposed. Now I will play with the back and forth and can make the comparison. See? And it's large, people can read it. And if you want, then you can put the two on, if this one for example, these are two, it's even easy to put the two on the same graph. You don't need two graphs for this. So you could have a larger graph with the two superimposed, right? With different colors. You could have a large graph with the four curves, and you could separate the unicast, unicast, multicast by green and red or whatever. And I would put, even to make it easier, probably different colors in here. Now we can use colors because it's easier to... Uh, dash, dot, dash, that, it's easier to use colors. And now this is an engineering thing, not a mathematician one. But if you, when you're talking to engineers, you need to be careful. That's why I'm addressing you this. In engineering, a drop probability larger than 1% is a disaster. A network will collapse. Maybe even less. Maybe even less. Yeah, 1% is yeah, the maximum. Of right? So what I want to say is, of course, in mathematics, is it's fine. I'm not complaining. When calling your attention is to this thing. Depending on the audience, if you'd be giving this presentation to an audience of engineers, engineers look at this and say, yeah, mathematicians. 
<laughs> because the networks stop here in 1%. I'm not interested as an engineer what happens. I mean, let's go to 10% in a very strong case, right? Would, would you have a mobile phone if half of the calls you would try to make it didn't work? Would you? Would you have a car if half of the times you put the key, the car doesn't work? Would you do it? No. Right, guys? So that's the meaning of the numbers, right? 50% means every two times one, it doesn't work. So again, from the mathematical viewpoint, I'm not complaining. And I'm not saying you should not show these. But depending on the audience, then you need to adjust these things. Because if you show these to a, an audience of engineers, who cares about 50% locking? 1% is already too much. And what about qualitative uh, uh, behavior. behavior of the jobs? It is oh, evident that it, it tends to unity. It is do, you have, do you have lifts in here? Lifts? Yes. Elevators? Yes. Yes. elevators. Okay. Are you interested in designing lifts for elephants? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yuris. Are you? But it is no, it's the behavior of the lifts. Again, depending on the audience, right? Depending on your, on your audience. Depends on the audience. Yeah. Remember one of the key things. You need to study your audience. I'm not saying this is wrong, Yuri. Don't misunderstand me. Of I'm saying I... it depends on the audience to whom you are speaking, which is right, a different yeah. thing. Depending on the audience. It's a different thing. If you are studying this from a mathematical viewpoint, okay, you are giving the trends and all these things. I'm not complaining. Let's put it this way. But if your audience is an engineering one or a applied one, whatever you can call it, then you need to know the things, or you should at least. Because you don't want to design lifts for ants, because ants are very small, or elephants. And you couldn't care less the trend of the lifts for elephants or for ants. Lifts are for people, like us, right? Unless you are in a zoo, and then, okay, then you need to adjust the, the lifts to the ants or to the elephants, or to the giraffes. But then you are designing lifts for a zoo, not for a university with people. I think mathematicians uh, desire, uh, want to show that we can deal uh, both with the uh, people, with the elephants, with the fishes. And right you are. <laughs> but again, depends on the audience. Yes. yes. That's my point. Here. Then the conclusions. Again, this presentation Again, okay, we discussed these things. The conclusions, uh, the model of the service, I would start by saying a model was developed for something. You want to sell network slicing for 50%, right? And then, was there a linear antenna race? I didn't see anything about array of antennas in your presentation. The inside, inside, inside the mm -hmm. Then you are calling an attention for something that it's not even in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And the stochastic location of users, mm -hmm. it's not too much information there either. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you are putting information here that is not in the paper, and on the other hand, you are not. A scenario was tested. What is the scenario that you have tested? It's not in here, right? Okay. Again, I'm not saying I have, I don't hold the truth in my hands. Please don't misunderstand me on this again. I'm giving you one perspective, which is not necessarily the perspective, the only perspective, and so on. I want to make this clear, and please don't be offended with these comments, okay? So, this is, I would stop here on this, and I would go to the other stuff that we discussed, which is the, this one. Ah, oh, that's a good one now. Uh, no, not this one. Um, to guess. Uh, where is the, where can I enlarge this, sorry? We have to put one. In the right corner, right bottom corner. 
Ah, I can do it here, of course, yeah. sorry. Okay, it works. Good. Okay, so again, I asked uh, Constantine to send me these. The original text was in Russian. Yes, then the, yes, so someone the translated yes. to English. Yes. I'm sorry, but I don't know Russian. I can read a few words in Cyrillic no already. No problem. <laughs> it's a start, right? I can read stop, restaurant, market already, this kind of thing. So it's not that bad. And this text is from Rector's Directive on the project proposals. So, so there is some template I should fill in and to send to the yes. research department of the university. Which will to, evaluate the proposal. Yes, to compete against other yes. research teams inside the university. Inside yes. the university, yes. So what I did is I've taken these and then I've put some comments in English. And of course you you have all this information, you can keep it for you. So just I, have, I have one question. Yes. By the way, um, the template of this um, paper, is it uh, reasonable or not? Or you could propose no, some it's... other ask for template for proposals? Is it, is it uh, transparent for you? Yes. Is it, uh, I would change eligible? a few things, but I would say in general terms that's usually what you have for project proposals. Yes. Yes. Or I, I should, as a competitive uh, person, to be inside every template, whether it comes from my rector or from you, it doesn't matter. Uh, so it depends on my level of expertise. I would say that as researchers, we should be capable of filling in any template. Any, any, <laughs> yes, because we want to win. Because we want to win, yes. yes. <laughs> so. Just, I have here just one comment. So this starts with the project survey, the abstract, with up to 3,000 characters. My comment here is that this is something you usually do in the end. That's the very last thing you do in a project, is to fill in the abstract and the keywords. Sometimes people start by writing this, it should be done in the end. Because only in the end we have all the information in our head to do it. If you do it in the beginning, it can happen that this does not fit the rest of the content. And this is a problem for evaluators because, oh, because people start reading these and they, they don't find the information in the proposal, okay, out, is promising something that is not going to deliver. So, what I've done here, this was full text, I just highlighted here some things and put comments. So please give a summary overview of the general state of the research related to the program and objectives of your proposal. So again, objectives must be clear, tangible and measurable. It's measurable and tangible does not sometimes mean that you have numbers in that. But means that you can, you are submitting a research proposal. So how can people see after two or three years if you have achieved your objectives? This is the question as an evaluator. You are proposing to develop a model for, let's go back to the network slicing. Okay. That's it. What are the, cons what are the assumptions? What are, you, are, what are you taking? What are you, you taking what? A stochastic approach or is it deterministic? Is it uh, for birds or for people? I don't know. I mean, can Tangible, that. you mean, Luis, I'm sorry. Tangible that for means instance, that For instance, I will something create, create a laboratory in two rooms with the following environment in order to do things. Yes. yes. Something so tangible is that you can... Tangible. Yes, yes, tangible. Tactile. No, again, even if, if you are doing something in algebra with Hilbert spaces. Yes, yes, I see. You still, in the end, you need to show that people reading these can need to like your idea, right? And I'm going to develop Hilbert half spaces or whatever nonsense you want to do. And the reason is because the space is too large and half I can fit in my room. I'm giving a lot of nonsenses, of course. And nevertheless, I will continue my let's say yes, discussion. This is, yes, this discussion. is a discussion. Yes. You know that in this audience you have uh, staff which are originally come here from the mathematics. Mm -hmm. 
And usually our results deal with mathem mathematics. And models. Mathematical models and so yes. on. And sometimes I can't do this. Because sometimes my objective is a mathematical model of some nature uh, event or, or so on. What uh, else? But can, can't you say for which, what is the purpose of the model? Ah, so here I should uh, say model which is designed in order to something, yes. You don't need to produce numbers, that's what I'm saying, but you can say what is the purpose of the model, right? What is the goal? What do you want to do model with this model? Model of what? Model what do you want what? to do with this model? You want to solve a problem, right? <laughs> no? Problem in general I terms. I understand, I understand. It's a problem in general terms. I'm not saying it, it's to be the 50% of the network slicing, but it's a problem in general terms. So what is the problem you want to solve? And what is the approach that you want to do? Again, I, I'm not saying I'm completely, I, I'm not saying because I'm not completely right, but probably some things do not apply here for some cases. I'm, I'm sure they don't. I'm just giving you my, from this perspective. Right? The other thing you should do, and all this is really applicable for everyone, I'm sorry to say this, is when you get this text, you should do what I've done, and then this is a checklist. You are preparing your proposal. Have I given the general state? Yes, I did. Have I described the objectives of my proposal? Yes, I did. Did I put the context in the situation? Yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? It makes it easier for you to read, the, to write, sorry, to write the proposal if you do these kind of things and you use it as a checklist. Because then in the end, you can check, again, you can check general state, yes, it's here. Oh, the objectives, yes, right? Nights and flights for mathematicians as well, I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. You are a mathematician too, <laughs> as far as I remember. So, they need to be concise, self-contained. Am I being concise or am I being too wordy? Is it self-contained or I have a lot of things that are not there? Okay, now, again, topical published contributions by other researchers. Have I put just my own papers or have I put the papers of other people? Your own. Are my own papers there? Check, please, check, 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 check. Preliminary work. Research, ob summarize your own project. Relevant research activities. Research work in the same area of the proposal. Right? Because... If you want to submit a proposal in Hilbert Spaces, you're not going to say that you are an expert in, I don't know, finite elements. They are different, right? <laughs> you can be an expert in finite elements, but is this expertise good for you to work in Hilbert Spaces? I don't think so. So the evaluator, okay, is is very. I mean, is the best guy in the world in finite elements, but he wants to submit a research proposal in Hilbert spaces. So he doesn't have the competences. He doesn't have the skills to work on Hilbert spaces. So how can I trust that he is going to achieve the objectives? So I need to show that I'm an expert in Hilbert spaces, and then I'm guess I will get my proposal through. And results achieved so far. This means that the papers that I have published with the models that I've already developed in that topic. So that people look, okay, this guy has done a lot of work on Google Spaces. He really knows about the topic. So even there are some things I don't understand, but he has published so much work there, I'm sure it's true. And he's very right in submitting this proposal because I mean, he's an expert, right? Provide information on the expertise in the research group. So competence in the area of the proposal. Previous papers. You have supervised already PhD students in that area. You have already international cooperation in that area. So you are really competent. You have done a lot of stuff in that area. People believe that you are capable of doing that research proposal. Because you are showing that you really have done already a lot of stuff. Okay, survey on project-related publications, submit on papers, report and discuss on publications, submitted papers, publications of other researchers. This is basically a state of the art somehow, 
link the proposed work with previous papers, showing what has been done, very important, what still remains to be developed. Because then, if you are such an expert, and then, then the question, I mean, but this is all done, right? Why does he want to continue on this? Because it's done. He has been publishing in this area for a hundred years. So it's, come on, this guy is old-fashioned. I'm not going to fund him. No, no, no. I'm publishing, I'm working in this area for a hundred years, but this still remains to be done. If the half spaces of Hilbert are not done, just the three quarters are done. What? Highlight that to the reviewers, so that they understand what still remains to be done. Don't infuriate the reviewers. Meaning, do not cover more than 10 publications. Don't put 11, don't put 13. Put the maximum of 10. Because if you put 50, you're telling to the reviewer, yeah, I know much more than you do. You, you tell them, ah, you, you're stupid. Ah, this, I'm so good that I need to show that I have 50 papers on these. You just read all of them. And then the reviewer, most probably, is not going to read any of them. Right? Because you were asked to put 10 and you put 50. And the reviewer will not have time to read 50. So, just skip it. Forget it. I'm not going to do it. Okay, if applicable, I don't have any comments here. Now, objectives and work program. Please give a concise description of your project's research program. So, research program, basically, again, general objective. What do I want to solve? The assumptions. I think this keeps being valid in mathematics. You only need some assumptions. Scenarios, I'm not sure if this valid in many mathematics, but in some is. What is the scenario I want to solve? It's the, the road, or it's inside the building, or whatever. It doesn't matter now. Perspective for model development. So, I'm going to develop my model using finite elements. Not method of moments. It's finite elements. It's different. Because method of moments has this and this and this, but finite elements and this and that and that. And this is much better than the other one. So, finite elements is the best approach for solving this problem. Not method of moments. Parameters for input and output. Again, maybe some things don't apply here. My apologies for that again. But what are the input parameters I have in my model? Am I going to consider 100 input parameters? I will not. For sure it will not work. I need to pick the most important ones. VT was not important, right? So I'm not going to use it. But the height of the antenna is important. I'm going to use the height of the antenna. What are the output metrics I want to analyze? The blocking probability. All the blocking probabilities of all users or just the user on the street? Not the one inside the, the building. Whatever, I don't know. And the scientific objectives. Again, clear, tangible, and measurable. Measurable in the sense people knowing, give something to people that in the end they see you have achieved your objectives. They are not necessarily numbers, but they have to be things that, in the end, they see, okay, he has achieved, he or she, sorry, girls, ladies, he or she has achieved these, he has reached the objective. Expected results. Please formulate expected results. I would say that there are many types of results. You have scientific results, which is for what the model is for and the output metrics that you have. You have dissemination results, which is papers in journals and conferences. It's a different type of result, which is very important in academia. Q1, Q2, impact factor, blah, 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 blah. Give target journals and conferences. Don't say, I'm going to pay to publish 30 papers. That's nothing. No, no, no. I'm going to publish a paper in IEEE, sorry my case, IEEE transactions on communications. IEEE, whatever, doesn't matter. 
show that you are aware of which are the journals you are targeting, and not the journals or conferences. Number of publications. Don't put, I'm going to publish papers. That's nothing. That's part of our profession. When you say, uh, I'm not sure, do you know this notion of quantity of information? No. You know this? Yeah. Okay, quantity of, in, in telecommunications, this is not even engineering. In telecommunications, we have something, it's related to entropy. Yeah? So, quantity of information is the novelty of the information I'm giving to you. That's a measure of quantity of information. That's how we measure in telecommunications the quantity of information. So, you are sitting here, hopefully, because you are receiving information, meaning something is novel for you, and you are not bored of listening to stuff that you already know. Number of, don't put things that people already know that you want to do. Publishing papers, of course, people know. That's part of your career. So you say that the goal is to publish papers, the quantity of information is zero. So say which papers you want, how many papers, where you want to publish. This is really useful information. And we'll enable the reviewer to say, okay, this is a real guy. He wants to publish the papers in applied mathematics or whatever the, the journals are. And these are two journals. Our main problem. Excuse me? Our main problem is from the, that from the point of view of five top 100 projects, the main objective is a number of publications. And Q1 and Q2. It's but then, but yes, then Q1 and, how, and Q2, you don't want Q3 or Q4. Uh, Q no, no, no. But that's, that's important because you it need to know... It doesn't matter where. It, uh, content doesn't matter. But, the, it's but it where? matters if it's Q1 or Q4, right? Yes, yes. So you need to show that you want to publish papers in Q1 journals, not Q4 journals. List they, the Q1 they, journals. They give me the restriction, not less than 30 papers per one project. Okay. It's, it's a crazy requirement, or it isn't crazy. It's not. But state which journals they are. Then you have networking results. No, oh, I know, I know, I know. Networking results, very important. Different type of results, which is natural, national and international conferences, cost actions, because this enables a lot of networking, interaction with other researchers, exchanging of information, joint papers with international colleagues. These are all metrics of success, let's put it this way. And these are valuable for a reviewer to see that we are really doing stuff and giving the numbers that our deans want for the rankings and all these kind of things. Education results. We are professors. Professors are supposed to teach, right? And to pass information to students. So at least back home, we need to show education results. And this means graduation of students. With this project, I intend to have this number of Master of Science students involved, of course, at a very low level, obviously. PhD guys, postdocs eventually, also these kind of things. So that there's also putting people on the wheel, you know, of the project. Indicate also if you anticipate results that may be relevant to other research fields. Being from applied mathematics, I would say, at least again, this is my perspective, engineering areas are of value. So if you are writing a proposal from applied mathematics, one, one of the areas, it's not the only one, of course, it can be medicine, it can be many other things. But one of them is engineering. Show links with engineering. They say that here, uh, that engineering is, is, is not so impressive. Multidisciplinary project, it means medicine, uh, let's say uh, space. Uh, okay, then put space in and, here. And so, and so on. Astronautics. But engineering is too wide. Okay. In what uh, area? I should write here. No, you're right. I mean, in your case, it's clearly wireless and mobile communications industry. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, the papers that I was presenting you, it's clearly these two. Don't put engineering at large. Put, no, no, this is with the guise of telecommunications engineering and even more specifically mobile and wireless. You are not working in optical fibers. Yes. I, I, right? uh, I am at the side of the authorities, not only in, in the university, but outside, in Russian and uh, 
research funds, they say, for instance, that uh, mathematics and engineering, it's evident. So, uh, the relevance to engineering is not so important. As other areas. It's, uh, yes, yes. No, no. You should show, you should show. Then the show other areas. In other industries. Show other and areas. Applied mathematics is not industry. That is the area of knowledge. I understand. Show other areas, Konstantin. Put space. Put... Sometimes it's almost impossible. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Depends, right? And may have impact outside science. Links with companies. Mm -hmm. Applicability of the developed work to companies. Transfer of technology to companies. That's Here, what this means. I interrupt no? you. Here I can write, for instance, I think that my results will be applicable to Nokia research. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking. It isn't necessary to negotiate to Nokia to write this words here. No. No. The inclusion of companies in the proposal may be a value. Again, you decide no. on this. I don't know. I think so. I, know. I think so, yes. Propose the organization of a final workshop to show results to companies. That's a good way to do transfer of technology. In the end, you organize a workshop with them, like you remember the, the one we invited me yes, years I ago? Remember, yes. With there were I remember there were people here from the city of Moscow. Yes. That's a good idea. The, now the guys in the city of Moscow so know. So here I can write that that is, will be one of the results of my project. I will organize a uh, workshop on such uh, the such title for such kind of industry and company. Yes. And that is will be my result. Yes. Yes, but then I should gather this workshop. Sometimes it's difficult. Yes, but of course the result will be very uh, competitive, of course, with such kind of problems. These are things that, again, I, this is not all applicable, obviously, but these are things that may add, let's say, the value of your proposal. Because you can do this, so you're not promising something that you cannot deliver. And if they are asking have impacts outside science, this is one of them, right? Yes. Impact outside science is not one more paper in a journal. Q1. Just like I organized, for instance, Summit 5G R&D Russia, yes? Yes. Why not? Yes. I'm trying to get, extract information in what is written there, right? This is the goal. Concepts for problem solutions proposed with such methods. Please provide a description with the message you plan to use. Show that you have precise ideas on how to tackle the problem. Identify... The, so, you know, it's going to be finite differences, not method and moments. Right? And it's going to be time difference. Finite differences. Fi no, uh, is it? FDTD. Finite difference, time... Domain. 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 Thanks. Sorry. Domain. Long time I don't work on this. Yes. It's not method moments. It's FTTD because I need this in the time domain, not in the frequency domain because time, I know how to do this. I know my problem and I know how to tackle it. I know how to get the approach to this. It's not... I want to solve the problem of people flying. I want to do it. I don't know I'm going to solve it. Yeah. Okay. Next. Identify potential risks and how to overcome them. Again, sometimes this may be applicable, sometimes it's not. Yeah, I want to do FDTD, but, but, the time increment, I need to study this. And I'm not sure if how it's going to do. I need to be careful with this. I know this is a tricky parameter. And maybe this will limit the range of scenarios or the frequencies I will study. With this, I can only study ants and not elephants. I'm just seeing a, a bunch of nonsenses. But it shows that I'm aware of the, how to pick up the problem and the limitations that the problem has. The reviewer looks at this text. This guy knows, really knows what he's talking about, right? Because he's showing that he dominates the topic. He has precise ideas on how to do it. Word package and milestones. Now, I think this is something you are not very familiar with, I can imagine. 
But we, we do both. Okay, so this uh, then of course it's what methods are already available, what methods need to be developed. Again, a checklist. Remember the checklist, guys? Checklist. Mm -hmm. Checklist. Sorry, just one minute. This is what I got. See? Do you, do you understand what I've done? Uh -huh. I've transformed this into Four, a checklist. Yes. See? Once, I Sorry, I forgot to show you this. I transformed this into a checklist. See? That's the idea. Now, work packages. You have a project, you have working work packages mean how to structure your work. Now it's very much engineering stuff, but that's what you are being. Don't blame on me, blame on the guys that have done this. So if you have work packages, means you need to define work, how to structure the work. Whether you like it or not, they are asking for it. It's not my fault now. So formulate the detailed program steps. This means you should structure something like this. Project management, which is something that's nothing to do about science. Let's put it this way, is on how you are going to manage the project. Then you have science, which is a scenario definition, assumptions, all these kind of things before you start. Then the development of the model. Again, this may have some engineering perspective here, but you use it as best, I can put it this way. Then you develop the model, you assess the model, and you analyze the results. These are at least the structure of the work packages. And then, Dissemination. Again, no scientific work here. This is publishing the papers, organizing workshops, and this kind of thing. So, two to five is scientific work. One is project management. It's not scientific, if you will. And this is being a journalist in comms. Right? It's telling others what we have done. Q1, number of papers, that's what they need. Now, once you define this or something similar, again, you need to indicate the leader of each work package. So, who is the, people, who is the person responsible for each of these working packages, of these teams? The project leader should be the guy in charge of project management. Don't put another name. Because if you put another name, the message you are saying is the project leader is just to give his name. He's not working. So it's not the, the project lead is the guy just showing off. He's not doing the work. So I'm not going to rely that this is going to be achievable. Identify who is doing what. You have five people in your team. Say, I'm, this guy is doing this, this guy is doing that, and I'm going to hire three PhD students. Yes, you still don't know the names. It doesn't matter. PhD student one is going to work on this. PhD student number two is going to work on this, and so on and so forth. Present a PERT diagram. Probably you don't know what this is, but it's very simple. Do you understand? This is project management, which is interacting with the four scientific tasks. Project management is interacting with all the other tasks. Yes? Question. What will be if, within some reasons, I will violate this project plan? How will I will present the results? Because the results should follow this working plan or not? What do you mean violate? Um, Narushit. During the project, uh, yes. the project leader decides to change a little okay, bit. Okay, but that happens. This is research. No, no, no. Sometimes the authorities of uh, research funds require that this plan cannot be uh, changed. changed. No, no, but the plan, this is a or plan. Or I, I everywhere should explain why I'm changing yes. it. If you need yeah. to change, you need to explain. It may happen. This is research. It, this is not in, in an Europe, exam. In, in Europe, yes. In community, yes. But not in Russian for funds and, and the level of Russian authorities. Okay. It, yes, it's you need to find You need to yeah. find your way. So Let's it's very understandable for me. And sometimes it's very dangerous for me. So I should be very clever. 
while putting at every VP concrete persons. Yes, it's uh, some specific features. But, but sorry, I but understand, the things, because but in, in Europe you uh, have, uh, how to say, you are looking for a process, but not for a result. Yes. And that is the difference. Yes, so that is a process. But let me give you an example. Yes. Following the conversation we had this morning. Yes. You have people that are experts, let's put it this way, in simulation. Mm -hmm. And you have people that, you have people meaning colleagues, right? That are experts in simulation. Colleagues that are experts in the mathematical modeling. So why don't you say that the person in... The person is, which is an expert in mathematical modeling will mostly work in here, or be responsible for this one. The person that is an expert in simulation will be responsible for this one. For example, right? It, doesn't it make sense? That, I mean, you try to fit the competences of the people to the groups. That, but again, you know best on how to do this. I don't want to teach you. I'm sharing information. Remember, guys? I don't know the Russian reality to the point of telling you how it can or it should be done. Sorry. My apologies. I don't have that knowledge. No, no, no. But I'm don't sharing be, don't, information Don't, be, don't you. be sorry, because uh, this plan Does, is very attractive. And we know this plan. But sometimes I should hide this plan inside the proposal. Because this plan is dangerous for me at the second year or uh, at the third year. Because they will ask me, why you uh, changed uh, this plan? Okay. Yes. And uh, here I should write some general things. Yes. Okay. There are some specific then... features. Yes. But, uh, and of course, this, is very, uh, this, is, uh, this way is very reasonable. This is, the, again... The... At least I should have it in my mind. My mind. Yes. Yes. Okay. On, in my internal documents. So this is what it's called the PERT diagram, mm -hmm. which means that see this, there's a flow in between the scientific tasks, but then the one which is project management and the one that is dissemination, dissemination they are on the top and on the bottom, right? And then you can even have, so they, they, they are asking for milestones. Milestones. Milestones means I have by the end of month three, I have my preliminary result scenario has been defined. This is a milestone. By the end of three months, is the project starts, the scenario, the preliminary scenario has been defined. And by the end of month six, at, after six months, the scenario has been defined. This is a milestone. And you can define the many others, like these. The, the assumptions are defined at the end of month nine, for example. I don't know, I mean, all this kind of thing. This is what they are asking for. They ask for milestones. This kind of thing. Then present the <coughs> contributions to be made by the project members. And in case by outside parties and leak the statements and so on. I would put here that you define intermediate reports <coughs> to be delivered at certain key dates. And who will be contributing to these reports? I mean, again, you don't need to put the whole list of people, but say, this is, I will hire three PhD students and they will be contributing to the scenario definition. And the person in charge of simulation will be the, the person in charge of this internal, it's an internal report, but it's a way to share information about the team, in between the team. So you can say you have an intermediate report with the scenario definition which is edited by the person in charge and contribution by PhD students. I'm not saying you need to put all of this information, but this somehow what's being asked in here. Contribution to be made by the project members is these kind of things. Whether you want to present it like this or not, that's another matter. Present the coordinated channel for the project work. The quality of the work program is a critical factor, crucial for design, the measuring resources are necessary for successful processing whether the project should be funded. Again, the duration of the project should be phases. You have a start phase, update of the state of the art is usually something you should do. You already presented something in the proposal. But your proposal has been submitted one year ago or six months ago. Probably in the meantime there are new papers on the topic. 
you need to update the state of the art. Define canonical scenario, assumptions, reference scenario, whatever, that is going to be taken as something that you need to use as a reference for everyone. If you have three people doing a PhD thesis, define a street with the same width and length, so that in the end you can show these. Because if guys have all different lengths and widths for the street, they, don't, they cannot compare the results, right? Then the model development, model assessment, analysis of results, dissemination and closure. You have to write reports or these kind of things. Then there is a Gantt chart, which is a way to show this evolution in time. The work packages. Work package one is project management. This is an example that this is a project with 30 months, so two and a half years. I've put here the months of the project, then here the years, and this is the, uh, the, the month. And again, the numbers, so this is repeated, it doesn't matter. And these are the reports or the milestones that I have to deliver. So, scenario definition is done in the first six months. Then there is also superposition in between the scientific tasks so they can interact with each other. So the model development will start in months four and will end in months 18. The model assessment, now this is small. See one of the problems of the presentation, but this is a word. So I'm, I'm uh, month 13 starts the model develop assessment. So there's some superposition, right? Because the assessment means I still need to change something in the model. And it goes until month 24. But already in month 22, I will start the analysis of results. We'll go until the end, and then this is mediation, publishing papers and so on. And then M means a milestone, and R means a report. Let me show you one that's a real example now. This is, by the way, a conference that uh, I'm organizing under the request of the European Commission. I'm not breaking any confidentiality here, it doesn't matter. This is the part of the structure of the conference, see? This has nothing to do with research. It's organizing a conference, actually two conferences. It's UCNC, it's this European Commission conference. It will be in Dubrovnik next year and then in port in 2021. See, the milestones, the deliverables, or the reports, all these kind of things. Now, a good way to show that you are working in an integrated way is to include meetings. You should have, let's say, a project coordination meeting every month with the work package leaders and the project leader. Maybe you just have four people getting together for one hour, probably. This is working okay, we have a problem with the student, uh, the scenario cannot be like this because the, the street is too wide. I don't know, whatever needs to be discussed. Working, work package coordination. So, you, every month, you should have work package leaders meeting with the team and discussing how the work is being done. Discussing science, I'm not saying discussing money. Here it probably can be discussing money, but here we'll be discussing science with the people. And then you have, I would say, everyone should be at least every six months together. Everyone. All the people working in the project. So they can meet each other, exchange information for all work packages, all models, everything else. All of them should be there. Then you have data handling, which I don't have too much to be said in here. This has to do with the archiving and so on. Then it's being asked sustainability. Please give a brief outline the perspectives of research of the project after the aspiration of the funding. So they are asking you to say what is going to happen once the project has finished. What are you going to do? So you should basically address the continuation or the growth of the research area. You are gaining more and more competencies in Hilbert spaces or whatever you do working what. Graduation of PhD students, you want to graduate more people. You want 
I, at least with us, it works like this. I can imagine it works like this as well here. Gain of competencies for junior professors, right? You want people to go up. Junior professors, senior full professors, you know, all these kind of things. This should be mentioned in here as well. Chances of a long-term partnership between the collaborating partners. So, strength of link with partners, increased links with international researchers. All these kind of things are results that should be there after the sustainability. Research after the expiration of the funding. The project is finished. What have you gained by doing research in this area? National and international cooperation. If cooperation with national and international parties is integrated into the program, the expected added value of the planned cooperation should be described. What do you gain with these? Exchange of information. Very valuable in research. Researchers have invented globalization before the guys in economics and politics have invented it before, right? Because globalization is to share information with the world. That's what they have been doing since science exists, basically. So exchange of information, joint publications with people. Internalization of the research group. That's how you get into the Q ones. Access to international scientific bodies. Let's not be naive. You can only have access to being an editor of a journal and this kind of things if you know people. If people don't know you, they are not going to invite you. That's for sure. And the only way they are going to know you is yet you have go to conferences, you meet people, or you go to cost meetings, people are there, you talk to them, you start having joint papers, people start seeing in their journals, oh, this has published with this and that and that, okay, then let's invite him or her to, to be an editor or whatever. If people don't know you, that will not happen. At least the probability that will happen is not very high. Talking about probabilities now, right? Okay, humans, I don't think this applies in here. Uh, okay, I think I've finished. Bibliography, it's a requested funding. Yes, this is more or less done. Yes. So, now we should have a a workshop to prepare a project proposal, right? <laughs> Home task. Home task, yes. <laughs> so, I'm more or less finished. It took me less time than I thought. It's quarter past five, but okay, it's good. Means you're not that tired yet. Thank you very but much. But I would like to hear from you now. I would like now uh, to have some time for discussion, whether you think this is applicable, what can be the problems of applying these. Uh, again, different areas, different ways of doing things. This is very clear. I'm sorry if I'm an engineer, but okay. It could be worse. I could be a philosopher. It could be even worse. Um, of course, you understand. I think that here I can calculate we have about 90% of PhDs and some of them full professors. Of course, I know that my colleagues are very qualified people. I know also, and you know, that Russia has the, some specific features in uh, research organization and research development. But nevertheless, maybe you have any comments to our university authorities how to organize these projects. Because you know, maybe you can sit down, you, yes. because uh, you are standing and we are sitting. Just now we are starting a discussion. Isn't okay. It? Isn't it? Yes. And I will moderate this discussion. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, you remember those meetings in autumn with your colleagues at International Board. Mm -hmm. And you know that uh, Willy Jagger was very angry with uh, the organization of project inside the Ruden. What was the main, uh, his uh, main, how to say? Criticism. Criticism. First, short time projects, because we have only one year for every project. Every year we should reload projects with another templates 
and with another objectives. Every year they increase uh, the result, and the measure of the result is the unique one, a number of pa papers. And uh, Willy Jäger was very angry. Uh, by the way, uh, he is a friend of our rector. He is telling them this criticism, but rector, answer. Please, Willy, you should understand that my people will scope. And main result for me is the number of papers and the number of citations of these papers. And that's all. And that's all. By the way, I'm a member of uh, uh, Science Foundation in the Higher School of Economy. That is uh, the uh, as, uh, MIT all over the world, High School of Economy is MIT inside Russia. Mm -hmm. Yes. 100% of uh, ranking, yes. By the way, they are working just like maybe all uh, science foundations all over the world. They have a competition, long-term projects, with such kind of proposals and so on. But our university is another one, just like it was maybe in China. You remember, they, should, they had nothing to do but to make a big jump during a very small period of time. But, but is it the unique way to get some results? And I'm sorry, one, one moment. And the rector, by the way, during two years, our university from 800 is now inside 500 QS ranking. So, rector answered, I have a result. But he don't want to listen that research will destroyed, will be destroyed. That is destruction. So, have you any comments about this? It's quite open conversation, yes. yes, yes. It's a very, very, very open criticism. I think, okay, first, I, I fully agree with you that a research project should not be one year. It's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. Uh -huh. And this means that if if you are really doing real research, I don't believe that in one year you can really go from the start to the end and publish a journal paper. You said that. With, uh, okay, if you have one person that is doing nothing else but that, but professors need to teach and all these kind of things, of course. Even and. So, if you, I would say that the only person that can do that is a full-time researcher or a postdoc, which ends up being a full-time researcher. A professor cannot do that because we need to teach, and a PhD student cannot do that because he doesn't have the, how can I say this, the, still the whole machine working to produce efficiently in one year from, that's why he's still a student, right? I mean, Usually PhD student is three, four years, it's not one year, so there's a reason for that. Because in one I year... Did, I, I didn't capture, I'm sorry, I didn't capture. So, as far as I understand, uh, postdocs is, postdocs postdocs is one of the mechanisms of solving this task. Postdocs it? is, I don't know, probably you don't have it here, I don't call it this, but a postdoc is someone that has finished the PhD, Yes. And he will continue, he or she will continue to do research for one, two years. Yes. After finishing the PhD. Continue. 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 Meaning he has done a thesis on something, and when this person has done the PhD on something, there were, he or, he or she did solve all the problems, mm -hmm. but he's still full of knowledge in the head, and in one, two years that follows, he will continue to do this line of research. Otherwise, the scientist is a researcher, which is hired for me, by me, to solve concrete tasks inside the project. Yes. Not yes. postdoc. Not supposed to. Not postdoc, yes. yes. If you hire someone that is a researcher and telling this person, okay, I have this problem, I want a model for the movement of people in streets with benches in the middle. You have one year to do this. I mean, someone knowing mathematics can do it. Whether the model is good or bad, that's not the problem. This person will do it. But I think that usually when you have a research problem and a research project, 
this should be three years or something like that. Less than three years, it doesn't seem to be that good. Serious, let's put it this way. And that does not mean that you are not going to publish. Of course. The life is continuing. Life is in continuing. spite of this project, yes. Yes. People will yes. publish, of course. Now, the matter is, where are you going to publish? And in the long term, how is it going to happen? Because, again, if you want to get more visibility and all these kind of things, you need to interact with people outside, then we go back to many of the things I mentioned. And by the way, the Chinese colleagues in China, do you know what they have done? The government in China, do you know what they have done with the universities to achieve what they have done now? Very simple. They so, brought a lot of Chinese professors from the United States and Europe. They paid them a lot of money to go back to China, to the universities, to the top universities, and they said, okay, you have 10 million euros. You have 10 years to build a research, or five years to build a research group. But they came from outside China. I know many colleagues that have done this. And they were very well paid. And on the top of these, the Chinese government was using a lot of money to bring people from Europe and uh, North America and many of the countries to go there. And they are still doing this. And to stay there, I know a colleague, he, gra he retired from Paris. And he was offered a position in Nanjing University. And he's there now. I mean, he's not full time because he has a family back in Paris. But he goes there every, he's there for typically three weeks. And then he goes back two weeks, and then he goes to Nanjing three weeks, and then back home two weeks, more or less on average. And he's supervising a lot of students, interacting with junior professors, having meetings with them, and all these kind of things. That's on how. That's what the Chinese government is doing. That's how we can achieve something. So the experience is very attractive, or not? The experience is, what do you mean? Of China. No, I, I'm... In our research. Excuse me? It's one of the ways. It's one of the way. Uh, uh, this is a way that you can, in a short time, achieve a lot of results. Mm. What? Because you have people with experience, so you don't have the learning curve. Again, you don't have a PhD student. A PhD student, the first six months is reading just to understand what the problem is. Can't do anything else. He still doesn't know what the problem is. He cannot solve the problem. He still has not understood the problem, right? You remember my question, we are discussing the criticism regarding the organization of this project yes. and the research, yes. So, uh, as far as I understand, you prefer to manage uh, research proce process more to manage the results and intermediate results. It's better. Wh or not? Is it clear, my question? Uh, is it clear or no, not? The, the, I mean, these things here, you, you can publish a lot of papers with these as well, of course. Of course yes, you can. I, I can have only one working, working project to publish papers and to manage it, and that's because all. Then, don't don't yes. misunderstand. It, it will be very fr fruitful. But you are free, Constantine. You are free. Yes, I am free. Yes, of course. But let, let, me, let me explain one thing. When, where is this? This, this one here. What, the thing that you just publish in the end. Of course, if you want to publish a journal paper. Yes. You can only publish journal paper when you have results. You cannot do it in here because the bottle is being developed. What? what you can do is to publish a conference paper somewhere here with the initial results. Okay. This is, again, this is not the truth. This is not the only way of doing it. This was just a, an example. But now this depends, but of course, you have just, it depends on many people you have in your team, right? Yes. Because you can, if you have like so many colleagues sitting here in, in this room, then you can imagine a lot of these projects, and they are shifted in time, right? They are shifted in time, sorry. So that's why we keep publishing on a yearly basis, in a, and in, of course, because we are not all starting from here. A student is starting from here, but we are, as a team, as a group, you are not starting from here. 
students are starting from these, but as a team you have many people that are shifted in time, right? So you have someone that is starting this one, but another person is already here, and another person is already here. So in the end, you have papers coming on a nearly basis. And again, it's, you, you can publish a lot of bad papers, but then this, the, the probability that these papers will reach the Q1 journals is not very high. Yes, yes. But, but usually, number of quarter shows the quali quali quality yes. of the Yes, of course. Of course. Yes, of course. And impact factor. Yes. So, thank you very much, Yuish, because, of course, I understand that your uh, lecture is not a medicine for us. It is not a headache pill, of course. But it's very useful. And I still have questions, because, actually, what uh, Russia is doing, and uh, Russian 20 universities, you remember, the 21 university, uh, universities of Russia are involved into this uh, great project. It will be fulfilled next year. This year is the last year of financing from the government level. I mean, uh, five top hundred, uh, yes. Nobody knows what will be then after that. It's very uh, bad for us. Because we should understand sustainability, you told us. If by government do not show me the way after this project, I am not sustainable. What I will tell to these people? And to 10 postdocs, so-called postdocs, which I hired during this project, yes. I should think what will be in three years. I have only one project with number of citations, with number of uh, papers. But, but you know, but you know that I have results results of European level in several magazines in both parts of my departments in uh, theory of probability and mathematical modeling and, and so on. So, some of my projects are hidden inside the salary of professors. Somebody should pay for these papers and if they have no money for producing results, they are hiding the real VPs inside these people. Yes? Yes. yes. It wasn't so, of course, in former Soviet Union, but we are still uh, going forward. Because, for instance, about post project. Thank you very much. You involved us to this project. It seems to me, from the, uh, let's say, European Union, Union level, they can manage the process all over the Europe, isn't it? Yes. Because they are managing process, not results. Because when I can see about 100 people from 50 universities in one hall discussing and they only tell to some to uh, to each other what they are doing and that's all yes yes so european union is managing process yes yes but, it's, it's very important end, for us in the end you have these people 100 120 people that meet three times per year yes yes and they go there and they present their results to the colleagues, but one of the major outcomes of these is joint papers. So yes, yes, yes. That is uh, the, that's result the result of cost. Yes, that's the result. They require joint they papers. Require. I yes. start. I am collaborating with a lot of colleagues in Europe and even outside Europe because of cost. Because, I, for example, I'm collaborating, and we have published already I mean, five or six papers with a colleague from Poland, from Gdansk University. We met in a cost meeting, then at the coffee break and the presentations, we saw that we were working in similar things. They were more, much more into measurements and these kind of things. We are more in the modeling aspects. We have published, and Q1 papers, see, Q1 papers. Why? Because we met there, we presented the results to each other. We met and are doing this with other colleagues as well. So, this process in the end, it's not just the process by the process. It's a process that in the end it has tangible results. Here it comes, tangible measurable results. results, tangible results, papers. Number of papers in Q1 journals, it's there. It's very tangible, very measurable. It doesn't need to be probabilities or whatever, or number systems. of users. Yes. Yeah, this is a tangible result. Number of papers published in Q1s with international authors. Here it is. So... So I do hope that next autumn you will see our next uh, project report. Yes. Yes. I think that 
uh, my rector will gather uh, the board in uh, October or November mm -hmm. with the same goal to present to international board our results. It's very interesting. Yes, I made some conclusions from pre the previous one. Thank you very much for this lecture. Because, of course, we... This was not a lecture. It was a sharing of experience. But we should, we should, of course, have some formalism. And that is formalism. Your formalism coincides, by the way, with our one. But sometimes we should have some workshop with some outsider. You are outsider because you are outside our university. And you will tell maybe for us the same words which everybody knows. But we should feel and we the results should be tangible. Yes. And just now, during these four hours, we can tangible. Yes. So thank you very much, Yuri. Please, you can put questions, no problem. Don't you have any complaints? Yes. <laughs> you can complain. Excuse me? When you find <laughs> yes. It was not a lecture. <laughs> it was a share of experiences. Not a lecture. By the way, Pr Professor Lanetsky and uh, Professor Sevastianov is not here. I told you that we have two pyramids, uh, research pyramids inside uh, our uh, cathedra. Big pyramids, yes. So that is another one with mathematical modeling there. And they have also. Uh, in, uh, they are also involved into big European project in CERN. Mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, data lakes, yes, yes, with analyzing data from collider, mm -hmm. yes. So we have we have very competitive results at European level because you will not include us if we have no these results into your project. But I'm just now I'm thinking about sustainability. It's a very important thing for me after your lecture. Thank you very much. So, colleagues, if you have no question, Lewis, thank you very much. Yes. I hope he's very open. He's very open. So, I hope, see, see I you hope that you, at the end of today, that you consider that you have not wasted your time. If that is what you think, then I've made my day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, that's all. You want, sorry, you have all the information here, yes. so just uh, put the information. Oh yeah, go, go, yes, yes uh, of course, obviously, obviously.